Yes, I would advise you to be careful what you say from here on out. You will answer to the Lord for everything that is said against me. Parental neglect can have a devastating impact on a person's psyche, more so than many people are able to realize. How an infant and child's needs are met in their early lives is paramount to how they will understand the world around them, and the adverse effects of parental neglect can last well into adulthood, impacting an individual's mental health, relationships, and overall well-being. From a very early age, children develop attachment styles based on how their primary caregivers respond to their basic needs. For example, if a child trusts that their parent will appear when they are needed, that when they cry, their caregiver will be there to comfort, clean, and feed them, they likely will be more trusting in the world at large. But when a child's caregiver consistently neglects or rejects them, they may develop an insecure attachment style, which can lead to difficulties in forming healthy relationships later in life. That is because the child learns that their needs will not be met by their caregiver, leading to a lack of trust in others in the world around them. A child's sense of self-worth is also heavily influenced by their relationship with their parents. More specifically, when a mother neglects or rejects her child, it can lead to feelings of worthlessness and inadequacy. A child may feel that they are not deserving of love and attention, leading to low self-esteem and an overall negative self-image. When a child's primary caregiver fails to provide basic needs, such as food, shelter, and love, it can lead to a lack of trust in the world around them. This can manifest as difficulty forming close relationships, or feeling unsafe in the world, and struggling with anxiety and depression. The child may also experience a sense of hopelessness and helplessness, feeling that they are unable to control their own lives. Early experiences of neglect can impact a child's brain development, leading to difficulties with emotional regulation, as well as cognitive processing and impulse control. These difficulties can persist into adulthood and impact a person's ability to function in daily life. The child may struggle with regulating their emotions, leading to outbursts of anger, depression, and anxiety. They may also struggle with decision-making and problem-solving, leading to difficulties in school, work, and relationships. Children who experience parental neglect are at increased risk for developing mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, and substance abuse disorders. These issues can persist into adulthood, impacting a person's ability to function in daily life and their overall quality of life. However, in today's case, that child would never make it out of their childhood. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today we are going to be covering the case of Mary Welch and going over the facts of what this child was forced to endure. This video came recommended by a subscriber who lived near the Welch Fusari household in Michigan, where this took place, who felt like Mary's life was quickly forgotten in the subsequent years. As always, it's my hope to cover this case with as much care and respect as possible, although little information is available. Usually in cases such as this, I take time to discuss the personality and life of the victim. However, given Mary died when she was just 10 months old, and the only people who knew her were the people who would end her life, there is very little here. With all of that said, if there is a video you would like to see on this channel, or a case you would like to see given more attention to, email my brother and I at dreading.official at gmail.com. With all of that said, let us begin. Seth Welch grew up in a conservative Christian family and had a strict upbringing. He served in the military and later worked as a truck driver. Tatiana Fusari, on the other hand, had a troubled childhood and had been in and out of foster care. She struggled with drug addiction and had been arrested several times. Despite their difficult past, Seth and Tatiana married and had three children, including Marianne. However, their marriage was tumultuous, with frequent arguments and physical altercations. They also had a strained relationship with Seth's family, who disapproved of their lifestyle and parenting. Seth and Tatiana's neglect of their children was made obvious before their children were born, as neither party changed their lifestyle to accommodate their pregnancies. Tatiana continued to drink and smoke weed as often as possible, usually with her husband. Likewise, Whenever the pair fought, Seth had no issue putting his hands on his wife during that time, with him reportedly claiming that pregnant women wanting special treatment was sexist. When their eldest child was born, they were found to have significant amounts of THC in their system, and the couple was then immediately reported to Child Protective Services, where they stayed on their radar for years. None of the couple's three children had ever been to a doctor 
in their short lives, with Seth claiming that going to the doctor was just as dangerous as not going to one. He didn't trust the medical system and earnestly believed that if the children fell ill, it was because that was God's plan for them. It's imperative to note that the couple's extreme religious beliefs, as they were categorized in the media and in all the information available about this case, seemed only to be used to justify their child neglect and extreme abuse. Seth did have a YouTube channel where he posted about his own beliefs. The adults who had gone to the hospital and taken medicine, which they had claimed was against the word of God. They used and perverted religious teaching to validate their behavior, but rarely followed the teachings themselves, as they didn't want to change their behavior. Despite the couple's decision to grow their family, they didn't care for their children in the slightest. They seemed to view them as leeches, taking away from their resources and giving nothing back. In statements given by relatives later on, they reportedly claimed that their children were lazy, and their lack of contribution to the household made them hard to deal with. Seth and Tatiana seemed to believe that if their infant children wanted to live in their house and eat their food, they needed to pay rent. Seth and Tatiana viewed their children as being needy, lazy slugs, often remarking on their children's antics to those around them, and in response to their, quote, poor behavior, they would withhold their children's basic needs. Water, food, and other necessities were taken away from their young offspring, to the point where, on numerous occasions, their older children would be forced to eat grass and dirt. This neglect and horrendous abuse was all that Mary had ever known. Reports had been made about the parents countless times by relatives, with many concerned about their well-being, but nothing was ever done. That is until August 2, 2018. Mary was found severely malnourished and dehydrated, with bruises and bed sores on her body. Her eyes were sunken in and she was visibly underweight. She had been neglected to the point of starvation, and her death was a result of their failure to provide her with the basic care and support she needed. When she was found by her parents, they, seemingly unaware that her death had been directly caused by their action, or rather inaction, called their lawyer to see what the next step was. An hour and a half later, they called the police. How long ago did you find the child? Uh, it's about an hour and a half. I um, was waiting. I called my lawyer for thing to ask, you know, what's the next thing I could do. And they said, wait till uh, they're here to call, uh, you know, the police and get that going. Uh, basically, it got to the point where I was waiting so long, I kind of went ahead and did it anyway. And they're all not here. So I was, just, I, I was waiting on legal counsel. So you found the child an hour and a half ago? Yeah. And called your lawyer first, correct? Yeah. Okay. So Are there any other children in the home right now? Yeah. Because I don't know if I'm supposed to call the police or not. I, I have no idea what to do. Okay. We will send someone out and we're going to investigate. Um, when was the last time you had contact with a child? Uh, last night, um, about last, yeah, yesterday afternoon, about 3 uh, p.m. is, you know, she goes to bed. And, you know, that was that. Okay, so you put her to bed last yesterday at 3 p.m.? Yep, yeah, and then this morning at like 10 something, he finally went in to check on her. He's like, okay, it's been way too long, so, um, yeah. It's been going on all the time, it's normal, so. So you're saying it is normal for your children to sleep from around 3 p.m. until 10 a.m.? Uh, you know, it's about 9. 9.30, yeah. So. They sleep from 3 p.m. to... I'm just taking on a couple of things here. Sure. What time do they usually have dinner? Oh, well, that's my head, because they're not all... They don't all kind of run out of schedule, but she... You know, she basically eats them... Uh, you know, she's up for a half hour after that, and then... No for that. Okay. And how old are the other children? Uh, four and two. And there's two other children? Yeah. And they're at home right now, right? Yeah. And you said when you found her, she was already believed to be deceased, right? Yeah. And that's when you consulted with a lawyer? Yeah. Do you believe she was beyond help already? Oh yeah, she was, she was bad at the door now.
when officers arrived on the scene, they found the home, Mary, and the other children in horrendous condition. The children were covered in dirt and feces, with it being clear they hadn't been washed in a long time. The house itself was also disgusting, with vermin, insects, and mold found throughout. The couple presented themselves as somewhat grieving parents, and claimed that they had no idea what had happened to their youngest child, that they had simply woken up and found her body. Seth stated that Mary was skinny, but she wasn't sick and she had been eating, quote, the good stuff right before her death. But it was clear that was not the case. As always, there will be timestamps down below if you would like to skip these interrogations. After Mary's death, both Seth and Tatiana were brought in for questioning and separated. Though the pair had talked to a lawyer prior to the questioning and had time to discuss how they were going to frame Mary's death, there was no foreseeable way to make the extreme neglect that their child lived through seem reasonable but they are fully unaware of this. The filth that they forced their children to live in, and the extreme duress they had them live under, is what Seth and Tatiana believed was normal, or so close to normal that Mary dying can easily be pushed under the rug, but that is far from reality. The interrogation began with Tatiana, with Seth being left alone, completely isolated for the duration. While this was most likely done due to lack of personnel, the interrogators wanted to place as much stress on Seth as possible, leaving him alone with the knowledge that his wife is being interviewed right next door, should have been incredibly nerve-wracking and emotional, especially given their youngest child's untimely death. But his response is anything but. Let's watch. Hi. Hello. Tatiana, this is my supervisor. We've seen each other, but I don't think we've met. I'm sorry if you're lost. I know that's uh Obviously, the last thing you want to be doing is this. So we haven't spoke yet. I know you've already spoken with Jason. Uh, my name is Jason as well. Um, <clears throat> but some of the same stuff that I got to turn this brain off. Some of the same stuff that he's already talked about. I wasn't there when you guys spoke, so I'd like to go over some of that. Um, obviously, he's already advise you of your constitutional rights uh, up at the scene. You still remember those rights. Mm -hmm. it's, um, Thank you for clarifying. Yep, no problem. Uh, do you want me to read them to you again, or you're still good to go? All right. Uh, like I told you, you're not under arrest, but because you're in this fine facility, would you like to just remind you of those? So, um, really, what I kind of would just like to do is just uh, to get a better understanding of how we are here today and kind of go back a few years even just to get to know you and your family a little bit. So okay. do you go by Tantiana or do you have a nickname? Tantiana. Tantiana? Okay. Nickname from the early thing to work. You can just give us an easy nickname. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How many children do you have? I'm... Sorry, five. Three. Three. Okay, yep. <laughs> All right. The interrogator does not believe Tatiana's emotion at this present moment. He has been made aware of the horrific details of the living environment and knows that she went without basic care from her parents. It's not like Tatiana and Seth were unable to take care of their children or didn't have access to food, as they both have clearly not gone without themselves. So the concept that she is only now upset at the circumstances rings a bit false. His body language and tone never changes, and he doesn't attempt to give her any kind of validation or comfort. The immediate portion after Tatiana's emotional outburst has been redacted due to private information about the other children being discussed, which is understandable. However, because of this, we cannot hear if she continued to present herself as being on the brink of tears. And, is, yeah. oh, and, and Mary. Mm -hmm. Okay. How old is your oldest? Four. And how and your oldest? Okay. So, um, at the scene there, I was told that verbal. Is that true that he doesn't, or uh -huh. he's very verbal? He's very verbal. Oh, I, I don't know. Someone, and you know how he gets mixed, in, uh, you whisper in one person's ear and as it goes down the chain, uh -huh. maybe he was just being shy. So that's he tends to get shy. But yeah, he did, he did some high-fiving for me, but. Um, he knows lots of words, he's just, um, sometimes Big Sister can be a little 
dominating. So Maybe she that's what it is. Him, but, um, and probably all the commotion probably really made him shy. And didn't, yeah. didn't wanna, so maybe they were just saying he was not verbal right now. Maybe that's what it was. Um, medical issues or any, nothing no, no, like that? Okay. Not at all. And Tatiana confidently saying that none of her kids have medical issues is a farce. As noted, none of her children have ever gone to see a doctor or a medical professional after birth, and it's likely this choice was made to hide their abuse. Child Protective Services became involved with the family after THC was found in their eldest child's system after they were born, and it's likely that they knew taking the children to a doctor would just cause them more problems. For, is she in any kind of daycare? Does she go no. to share preschool? Um, no, I homeschool. I have my um, my degree in early childhood oh, education. Oh, you do? Okay. So Good I, for you. So I just, from being at home at the farm, I can at least give them an initial education before yeah. Yeah. we decide to send them off to the grade school. Absolutely. So, have you yeah, Absolutely, yes. Okay. Like, and what kind of stuff? She is fluent in her alphabet. Her number is at least up to 20. Yeah. Um, although she knows other numbers like 160, but not in sequence. Um, okay. She's practicing her writing. Mm -hmm. um, she just has a little issue with the numbers. They get a little backwards. But um, okay. she knows how to spell words like hi, cat, dog. Oh. Um, she knows the list that starts with E. She kind of do better than Jason. <laughs> the hi and the cat and dog part. Um, <laughs> so... Um, a doctor that she sees? Does she have a primary doctor? Not anymore. We okay. did have... She's great and everything. We just, uh, we only go if there's an issue and there just hasn't been. Well, good. Tatiana is a brilliant liar. She is confident, poised, and prepared. It doesn't appear to be nervous in the slightest bit. What she just said is a complete and utter falsehood. But more than that, the very concept that her children only go to a medical professional when they have an issue and they simply have never had any medical issues prior to Mary's death is absurd. The two other children were found to be completely malnourished, to the point where their bodies couldn't fight any potential illness. But, from Tatiana's point of view, that is completely acceptable. We'll do four to six if you want. Okay, and so at what visit, obviously it was probably the last visit, mm -hmm. is when he recommended the helmet, the yeah. head shaping. But so there was never any concern about the shape of her head from zero to 18 months? No, and it, that's why it was such a concern for us as to why he would just bring this up out of, out of nowhere. And... So what was the problem with the shape of her head, according to him? He said it was, it was off. It was just not circular. And, I mean, I wasn't offended. I was just taken aback. And then um, my uh, stuff found out that they, it's commission-based with these products that they try and push. Um, so um, we don't know specifically. This is here today. Sure. But we think that we'll he's trying to push the helmet. It was a $3,000 helmet. and called CPS and said that we were being neglectful or something or other. Okay. Tatiana's complete inability to see her own fault in her actions is incredibly disturbing to watch. Let's think about what she just said for a moment. While sitting in an interrogation room discussing the death of her youngest daughter, which was caused by her own neglect, she is trying to claim that the medical issue that one of her children faced was a farce, made up by a doctor who was trying to earn a commission. She then directly states, with absolutely no sense of irony, that after Seth and her decided not to fix the issue, this doctor accused them of child neglect. She is entirely unaware of what her words are actually saying. Instead of showing her to be a smart, compassionate mother who was suffering a tremendous loss at the present moment, Tatiana is showcasing how extreme neglect, especially for medical issues, is a pattern in their household, that neither her or Seth actually care for their children, and that they ignore advice given to them by medical professionals because they believe they simply know better. Unless their doctor was an incredibly corrupt, vindictive person, which is unlikely, 
they wouldn't report a family for potential child neglect if they didn't earnestly believe that was occurring. And given that the family already had a case with CPS, medical professionals would be looking for indicators, which they no doubt found, given the family's history. Within minutes of this interview starting, Tatiana has told the police that they have a long, documented history of child neglect, but does it so confidently that it seems as if she believes she has just exonerated herself. Oh, okay. Yes. How does that work? Wonderful. Was that was that a choice? Yeah. Was that like um, what do they call it, like a uh, midwife or something? Yeah, it was a home birth. Okay, and so how does that work when you choose to have? First off, I mean, why did you go from being from her in a hospital and some transformation here where you said we want to do um, um, the birth. midwife? Yeah. Yeah. The um, being at the hospital was very invasive. They. Uh, with me after she was born. They wanted her out of the room. They wanted us there for three days um, because uh, apparently I pushed out a lot more fluid than they were expecting. This is untrue, but goes to show what a serial liar Tatiana is. As mentioned, when doctors checked, they found drugs in her daughter's system. They reported this to CPS, who then had to fully investigate Seth and Tatiana to determine if they were fit to be parents. Tatiana determining that this was invasive and wrong for the doctors to do that shows her inability to see fault within herself. Any report to CPS has to be false, because she is a good mother who would never hurt her children. A doctor determining that she might be neglectful has to be done out of spite, because she would never do that. And the fact that she is saying this to police while in an interrogation room after the death of her child from neglect is absurd. The interrogators continue to ask Tatiana questions about her home birth, her midwives, and other topics completely unrelated to Mary's death in order to get her to let her guard down and feel as comfortable as possible talking to them. Whenever they note a particular subject matter seems to spark her interest, they stay on that for a while, allowing her to continue talking for as long as she wants. All of the sorrow and emotion that she had at the beginning of the interview quickly goes away, and she becomes incredibly confident and self-assured throughout, as if she has completely forgotten why she is there. I'm going to fast forward through that portion of the interrogation, but a link will be available down below if you want to see it in full. So she coughed. Huh. I like, oh, we need to keep her protesting. And then, um, I just think it's because they just wanted to charge us more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theory, yada, yada, whatever. Yeah, you never know, though. Right? Exactly, right. you don't. So I just think they wanted to keep us there for three more days, and then we had, they wouldn't, like, allow me to see her except to nurse, and they were saying, oh, you can just give her food here. And don't worry, well, you can rest. I don't want to see my baby. Yeah. And then they would have, like, Wick come in and give me information, and then, you want to have newborn portraits? No, can I just go home? Right, right, right. So we just didn't want to. Anymore. So that just turned you off to the... And having a home birth right after uh, I gave birth, Seth went out and bought me a pizza and I ate that whole pizza. <laughs> <laughs> right after hey, I gave birth. Bonus. Was, was, at four months, was she, was she uh, developing well? Was she getting to be a roly-poly? How did your kids develop? Um, every, every child's different, I know that, but... Tatiana's eager nod is strange, given the circumstances. None of her children had been developing well. They were underfed and malnourished. They would not be developing like a normal child, and would have been incredibly far behind. But Tatiana is entirely unable to recognize that. She is eager to talk about how her now-deceased child, and explain why Mary was actually fine the entire time. They all were very um, engaging and active. Uh -huh. Yes, Roly Poly is a great way to describe all of them, actually. Okay. Um, the only thing they were late on was uh, walking. Okay. So, would you say, like, chubby cheeks and... Uh, that was she always thinner? She was always petite. Always petite. Yeah, she was never... Nothing chunky about her, just. But, babies. but nothing concerning either. No, no. So she was still fitting into the size diapers and yes, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So when, because I, I mean, I've got kids too, but I probably much like Seth. I didn't do mo most of the diaper shopping. Mm -hmm. But I know there's like months 
Like yeah. there's the zero, the infant, or the t t newborn. newborn, and then it goes like, like what? One, two, three. So that's based on months, right? So it'll say like zero to three months or something like that, or does it say three to six months? Or is it not like zero that? Zero to three months um, is usually five, still newborn. And oh, then still, three okay. to six would be size one. So when she was three to six, was she wearing size one, three to yeah, six? Yes, she was very, she was good with her diapers. Okay, so although even though she was petite, she was still growing into the appropriate, the age appropriate diapers. Yeah, she was very tall. Okay. And, um, and even her, even her clothes, like her two T's and four T toddler stuff, was she age appropriate with the sizes that she was growing into? Yeah, we in fact had to get larger because she was so long. Oh. Um, but they weren't so baggy that they were falling off from her. No, okay. not until. Um, Good. Actually, not at all. She finally started to fit them fully when she yeah. was maybe a year. Okay. And that's right. when, yeah. But now, feeding, he turned into a chunker for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And obviously he grew out of that. Um, and so was he still age appropriate, or did he kind of go uh, an age or two over where he should have been? He was a tad over. Okay. Um, not in the diaper sense. Um, but, uh, I mean, right now he's wearing 3T to 4T diapers. But that's because they're the pull-up ones. So yeah. I'm trying to encourage potty training. Yeah, well, good. Um, but uh, his clothes right now are uh, 3T. Oh, so he is over then, yeah. Yeah, but he's, he's going to be 3 soon, and I just yeah. don't want him like, to put his arms up to have his belly out. So well, I plus you want to buy him once. You want him to last more than a week. Yeah. Right at that age, they're just sprouting out. Oh, and so, so you didn't work. When did you go back to work? Uh, about ish. February of this past year. Of this year or seventeen? This is two thousand eighteen. Yes. So this is. And that's when I started working at McDonald's. Okay. And so February. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So seventeenth actually. So, um, so in October, so from uh, so October 23rd to November 23rd, one to, to December to January to February. So basically, the first four full months, she was fresh from the source, bread, breastfed as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And same story. If you went somewhere, she went with you. Yeah. Seth never had to feed her. No. So and for four months, anyway. you never fed her. No. Okay. No way. Not that he couldn't. I just no. But why? Yeah, why if you're right there. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was winter cuddle time. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, February 17th, you go back to work. Well, why did you have to go back to work? Um, just to be blunt, just to support the farm. Yeah. Yep. Um, give us some startup money. Because now you. You guys used to do fruit farm produce stand, and Seth was saying that just didn't really take off. Yeah. So now I was trying to do a U pick strawberry thing, and so I would take. I was pregnant with Mary, taking Elizabeth and John down to farmers markets four times a week from six to three. Oh. Yeah, it was grueling. It's exhausting. Yeah, and having to manage the children and then interact with the customers, and some days were just not. We didn't pay the gas to no. go down there. So. Uh -huh. I don't blame you. You pick strawberries this year took off phenomenally, and we just we're going to expand that way. So now, is the farm whose passion is that? It started out as Seth. I, thought I was born in, in Brooklyn, New York, so I didn't. Not your passion then. Not, <laughs> not then. <laughs> so, is it your passion now? Absolutely. Okay, so this is something that that Seth wanted, and then you grew to love, or yeah. okay. And that's why I work at McDonald's. I wouldn't otherwise. No, right, right. So, so then, so February 17 rolls around, and at this point, months old, <laughs> how do you manage feeding them? Refrigerate bottles. Okay. Because I was only doing four-hour shifts at the time, um, just so they can see my work ethic. So I would do, um, I would leave one bottle out and then one bottle in the fridge, and I would the day and then put her down to bed before I left and that was at seven o'clock. Right, so you your shift was seven to eleven. 
7 p.m. to 11. Yes, sir. So, on a typical day, what time in the morning would be your first feeding with her? Uh, at that time? At that time. Um, maybe 5, 3.30, 3.30, three, three, three okay. and then So, at 3.30, she would wake up, mm -hmm. and would she do a full feeding? Yes, although she would um, fall asleep. So I'd, I'd wake her up. You just keep nudging her. her. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when you, now typically speaking at 3.30 when you woke her up, would she need a diaper change as well? No. Okay, so. She wouldn't. Because she was up at midnight before that eating. So so the last feeding for the night would be mid. Well, well let's just start at 3.30. That would give, okay, yeah. give us a good time frame. So at 3.30 there would be a, um, a full feeding and her mm -hmm. diaper was fine. No no pee, no, no poop. She's good. Yeah, she was fine. So then when would be the next feeding? Between 5 and 6. And, and that's when I would change her. And would that be another full feeding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I would change her then, and then... And when you changed her then, it would be due to... Urine. Urine. Mm -hmm. And then the kids would be up too, and then so I'd leave just to be awake with the kids. And mm -hmm. the kids would have breakfast while Mary's either eating or sitting in her little bouncy chair looking around. And then... Um, so at four months, she could sit in her bouncy chair and look around and... Yes. Okay. She was always able to, to hold her head up on her own. But um, it was a little rocker chair, not a bouncy chair, I'm sorry. So she would lean back in it and put batteries in it, and it rocks on Oh, yes, so. yeah. So the next feeding, is, uh, we have a five to six time frame. The next feeding is, would have been when, about? Eight to nine. Eight to nine. Yeah, she would feed every two hours, on average. Another full, every feeding was a full feeding? Was yes, she was, feeding? yeah. And eight to nine, how was the diaper? Um, depending on the day or um, how much she ate, I would change her poop three times a day. Okay. That I made note of. Okay. So um, it's hard to give you specifics on a, an actual day, but if she didn't poop then, the next time there would be a poop. But it was always one in the afternoon. So either that, either this chain, this feeding, or the next one is typically a poopy diaper. Yes. Okay. And the next feeding was I know you told me, but I'm not good at the math. Another two hours after that. So you're thinking 11 to 11 to noonish because I know she'd eat when the kids would have lunch too. So noonish. And then the kids would have their snack around two, and she'd be eating again. So I can say that either the eight to nine or the noonish feeding was a poopy diaper change. Yeah, and it was not. I mean, she didn't do solids yet. There wasn't solid poopy yet. No. And then you said after noonish was uh, what'd you say? Two, uh, two. Around two, the kids would have their snack. Maybe two to three. Um, how about the diaper situation on that one? She just always pee. So every time I got her to to, um, to feed her during the day, there was always pee. So every every daytime feeding had a had a wet diaper. Yes. Holy smoly. Yeah. Well, she yeah. was eating a lot. Yeah, she was. It was just at the three thirty, which I was grateful for that I didn't have to change her diaper at three thirty in the morning when I wanted to go back to bed. Right. So then. Five ish, five to six, or is this the, or would there only be one more feeding before you went to work? Or? Yeah, so around five, when the kids would have dinner, okay, because I would put the kids down for bed before I left also, and she's in the winter, so the, it was darker outside, yeah. so they would sleep yeah. earlier in the day. Um, so I'd feed everyone, and then that's bed for the night, which would be about seven, six thirty, because then I'd have to get ready for work. 6.30, kids would go to bed, and there'd be a bottle on the counter, and there'd be one in the fridge, just in case. But first, you'd... Yeah. While well, the kids were eating dinner, yeah. Would, you, would, you, would, you put her to bed? would she be asleep when you put her to bed? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you would feed her to sleep, mm -hmm. and then lay her to bed. Okay. Yes. And uh, there wouldn't be anything, not even a, a teddy bear in the bed. Not okay. that early. Okay. Um, so, um... And she would sleep until... Maybe midnight. So Seth wouldn't even sometimes need a bottle. So I would just use the bottle so it wouldn't go to waste. And then I came home. So if you were already home, then you'd use the bottle. Yes. 
But if you weren't home, Seth would use the bottle. Mm -hmm. But what would you do with the one in the fridge then? I'd use it the next morning. Okay. I just want to make it. Yeah, at 3.30 um, when she would get up again. And it was 3.30 clockwork. She, she knew. I would sleep on the couch because I would just know that she'd be up at 3.30. So, so let me just go over this um, to see if, if I've got it right. And so actually I'll start with, um, I'll start with midnight. Okay. So typically either right before you got home or about the time you got home there was a feeding. Yes. I think she just knew Mama was home. Now was it, was it always you or did sometimes Seth feed her prior to you being home? It was always me. Okay. I just, I chose to and he was very kind about it. He said, you yeah. need your rest. And yeah. Like, Really, Seth didn't even need those bottles that were left behind because he, he no, didn't. I remember, no. Okay. And she started eating solid food a month after that, and that's my 3 to 11 shift. Oh, okay. And that's when she was eating her solid food, so I would, I would um, grind up, um, you know, organic vegetables mixed with breast milk. Yeah. And he would feed that to her along with some oatmeal. Okay. So before we get into that, let me just okay. first make this sure this timeline's all right. Okay. So at midnight, you would marry. At 3.30 uh, in the morning, she would wake you up crying. Mm -hmm. And you'd get up and you'd feed her again. Her diaper was fine because at midnight, you changed her diaper? Yes. Was probably, was that poopy? Or Most likely. It was okay. Because yeah. she was sleeping for four hours before that. Yep. So then at 3.30, a full feeding, diaper's fine. Mm -hmm. 5 a.m., full feeding, probably a wet diaper. Yes. Yeah. 8 to 9, full feeding, maybe a poopy diaper. Noonish, full feeding. If the other diaper wasn't poopy, this one was. Yes. Yeah. Um, 2 to 3, full feeding, wet diaper. Mm -hmm. 6.30, just prior to you going to work, you'd feed up. Lay her in bed, and then you're off to work. Mm -hmm. And then you'd be home by midnight. We'd start the thing over again. Yeah. Okay. So now you said those habits changed at some point. At about six months. At six months. Mm -hmm. So at six months, did your hours change? Is that yeah. why these habits changed, or did they change because or a combination of both? Mm -hmm. Um, I it could have been a, a combination of both. I know because she was growing. She was eating more, and we were encouraging the solid food so she could gain more weight. So we just wanted, I mean, I was putting water in her mashed potatoes so she can eat something. Um, so when she was growing, so now at six months, was she wearing 6T? Was she wearing age-appropriate size diapers? Lengthwise, yes. Length? But she wasn't filling them out widthwise. So she was wearing the three to six month clothing. And how would, how do you feel about weight size? Was she okay or was she? I was a tad concerned, but then I remembered. Um, I'm a mom, so I'll just worry about anything. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But then I remembered Elizabeth and how petite she was then, and how she would fill in lengthwise, but not widthwise, until she was about a year. So what? But what was your tad concern? What was that? Was she just not gaining enough weight, or was that the concern? It was. Possibly, it was just, um, I think what got to me was seeing, like, other babies just so chunky and, and always hearing, like, oh, she's so small. And I was like, yes, she, she's premature. She's petite. Mm -hmm. He's alone. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then also, I forget, like, all these babies are formula fed. And there's nothing against formula. Sometimes mothers mm -hmm. need to do it. Mm -hmm. But the formula is what chunks up the baby sure, quickly. Sure. And I just would do that. Um so then I got it out of my head. It was just a little So it, you had a little bit of a concern due to her weight, but not her length, but you weren't overly concerned. You got it out of your head because you realized that she's fine. Yeah, I was, I was being a little bit, I suppose. But when you realize she was fine, this phrasing is paramount because he is affirming to Tatiana that Mary was fine, despite the fact that she was malnourished. The child in question is dead and it was obviously not fine by any estimation. Tatiana agrees with the officer, seemingly forgetting that her child is dead. At the beginning of the interrogation, at the very thought of her youngest daughter, Tatiana had burst into tears, but in the time they had been speaking, she has seemingly forgotten about her entirely. 
So for one, at, at about her six six month mark, which would have been February, March, April, so mm -hmm. in April ish, she had one week of sleeping a lot. Yeah. Okay. But then after that one week, she went back to the basic schedule that we just discussed. Yeah. And did her schedule ever change again? Not until recently, which I thought she was going through her nine month growth spurt. She right. was sleeping a lot lately. So recently, her her um, her um, schedule changed again. And uh, when you say recently, about when ish was that? Three days ago. All oh, three days ago. Okay. So three days ago, what what happened then? Um, we would. Um, so three today is Thursday. So uh, Tuesday was it Monday? Tuesday, what, Tuesday. You remember what day that you were specifically remember it changing, or you don't have a specific recollection of it? I don't. I don't. But I know I didn't have work. We can say Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Tuesday sounds fine. Um. So yes. tell me what you noticed. She got up at, at 9 o'clock in the morning. You were so tired, weren't you? And she went to bed when? Uh, the night before that. 7 o'clock. Okay. So she got up at 0 9 after going to bed at 7. Mm -hmm. And it just reminded me of when she was 6 months old. It was seemed consistent. Then she would eat like crazy. And then she would doze off again. Like she was ready for bed immediately after eating. So, uh, so I just, okay, it's consistent with the other children and with her six-month-old growth spurt. So I put her down and she'd sleep for about three hours, get up again, eat, and it seemed like she wanted to go to bed, but I, I kept her up. And she hung out and was interactive, smiling, um, but then she'd start to fuss because she wanted to go back to bed. She was very tired, and she only likes to sleep in her bed, she, or she'll sleep in the car mm -hmm. or the truck, but... So, so um, three days ago, did things happen enough that we could establish the routine? Was she on a three-day routine? Could, like we just established two different routines that she was on. Mm -hmm. Did she have a routine the last three days? Or no, it was very. It was a bit erratic. Mm -hmm. She would. I would try and keep her up just because I was worried that she was sleeping so much. Mm -hmm. But um, when she wanted to sleep. She wanted to sleep. Was she eating? Yes, very well. And, uh, I mean, the Sunday before last, we went to Golden Corral, and she just feasted. She really liked the marshmallow sweet potatoes. <coughs> so you thought this was a girl spurt, and is that because you noticed her growing again? Yes, and I remembered with my other two children in the So at six months, we were. Yeah. And so at this at this nine month growth spurt, what how how much were you guessing her at then? Maybe twenty. Okay. And when was the last time that you thought she was twenty pounds? And yesterday, when you thought she was 20 pounds, how long would you have guessed her to be? I mean, her legs would wrap around my waist. She's quite long. Because um, she was born at 20 inches, right? Mm -hmm. So her head here, and she would just wrap around the side there. So I... Uh, Six okay. Quite, quite long. So these last three days that she was going through a growing spurt, you were off from work Tuesday, and that's the first day that you noticed that. Yes. Yeah. And then I went to work once yesterday, and I work. And she does have a different schedule when I go to work. If you need to make note of that. Yes. What's what's that? So in the morning she gets up at seven, along with the other children, breakfast for her and for everyone, and that would be nursing and, and nursing for about a half hour while the kids eat, and then oatmeal, oatmeal with maybe some maple syrup in it, or oatmeal with strawberries in it, 
Just to finish. Spoon oatmeal or oatmeal mixed in a bottle and just gonna Okay. Nice and chunky for her. Okay. Um and then I'd keep her up and she would be awake until I had to go to work. So she'd be awake, then it was time to go outside and help daddy with the field. And we'd do weeding or I'd sit Mary in her stroller and she'd just sit and watch the ducks and just just laugh at them. So you didn't work you didn't work was it seven days or I'm sorry, what? You start your day again, I was busy, it was it 7 o'clock that you started your day? In the morning, yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry, your work day, on your days of work, what time did you start? 3 o'clock in the morning. 3 p.m. So you'd keep her awake from 7 till 3. Till she's 30. Till she's 30. Yeah. And so during that time that she was kept awake, how many other meals did she have? About four, possibly, yeah. So one she of them was just nursing. Well, the 7 o'clock one was breakfast. It was nursing for 30 minutes, oatmeal, some maple syrup, or fruit, whatever you had around. So when would the next meal then be on, on, on this different routine day? Oh, probably about when the kids want, would usually want a snack around 9. So it would be then. She eats maybe 9, 30, 10. And that's, um, that would just be quiet time for the kids. The kids would go in their room and have, they could read, they could sit in their bed quietly. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and that's mom entire hour. Okay. And then if the kids were getting too restless, then, oh, time to go back outside. Um, or they'd have to clean their room. Just yeah. But um, for yesterday, um, the kids, we went back outside. It was just so nice out. Um, she likes to, it keeps her quiet if you go for walks in the stroller. So we just went up and down the driveway, we checked the mail, we picked the garbage. Um, the wind will blow garbage from other places sometimes. Um, help daddy with the weeding, we cut some weeds for the goat, and, uh, and then, I mean, that's another couple hours. And then it'd be about maybe 2.15. Or no, I'm sorry, it'd be about one thirty. So the last time she would have ate would have been one thirty yesterday in the afternoon? No. Um, I'd feed her again at one thirty and then um, What was that feeding? Nursing and some oatmeal. How long was that nursing? The nursing was about twenty minutes. The oatmeal was what took longer because she was about eight ounces of oatmeal. Um and then I would, uh, I think the kids were still outside. I just, um, oh yeah, um, and, um, resting my feet before work. I'm just standing for eight hours. That was at 1.30? Yeah. So then, um, 2.30 was when Mary would finish eating. 2.30 was, yep, was the end of it, and that's when I would change her diaper again and put her, and put her down. Poopy diaper. Yesterday morning, when I got her up for the day. Have you noticed a decline in poopy diapers? No. No, not at all. Just such a surprise to me. I mean, this morning, when I got her up, she had spit up, and I just... So yesterday morning, when you got her up at 7, she had spit up? No, this morning. Oh, this morning. At 9, when I got her up, when I tried to get her up. Yeah. I thought maybe she, she choked on, on her spit, and that's why she that's why. What color was her spit up? Um, it was foamy and and brown. So I thought maybe it was the, the oatmeal and the fruit mixed in there. So where was the spit up at? Um, the side of her mouth. Um, um, the side of her face. And was that, did you think, I don't know, was that food? Was it blood? No, it wasn't It was not blood? No, she didn't have any kind of... Vomiting of blood or anything like that? No, never. Okay. We would have taken to her doctor. Well, sure. That yeah. never happened. So 
So you were you were certain it was food? Yes, essentially. And it was on the side. It was on what side of her face? Her right side. Her right side. Okay. And then that's when you noticed that she was unresponsive. It was yes. this morning when you saw that? And what what happened next? Uh, I uh, I um, she. Excuse me. Um, her eyes were open. Did anything look else look strange other than obviously just stood up and that her eyes were open? Or did other than that did she look as usual? She's just cold. Okay. So I went in to the to the, just to um get set. And it's an emergency and he's like and I was just so shocked and he reminded me I knew CPR and he told me to start. So I took her from the bed and I put her on her changing table and um I I started CPR and I did the the two finger touch on the chest. If you use your whole hand you could break ribs and I just didn't want to do that, that's for sure. I know this is tough. So I did a two finger touch on the chest and her back and I um wiped her mouth and I did um so you did this on her ta on the kitchen table? No, the changing table. On oh, the changing table in the bedroom. Yes. Her tone radically shifts. When she is describing what she did when she found Mary, her tone goes up and becomes more in line with someone experiencing distress. But when the officer interrupts, asks her for clarification, her tone drops back down to a normal range. This could be indicative of someone who was feigning distress, which is more than likely the case. Tatiana's estimation in the last days leading up to Mary's death are entirely false. Everything she states about the lengths she went to to make sure her daughter was taken care of her leaving breast milk for her daughter and taking care to mix it with other food is a lie. Mary rarely ate, and the majority of the time didn't eat enough to make waste. But the way she talks, how she adds details, it all seems believable. So you said you did it on her mouth and you wiped her mouth. I wiped her mouth first because it was the, the, the spit up. And now that I think about it, I think it was banana and oatmeal. You know when banana's been sitting out and it's very ripe? Oh, yeah. It gets that like brownish color? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but ripe banana is very sweet and she eats the oatmeal better with it. So what did you wipe her mouth with? A baby wipe. A okay. lavender scented baby wipe. Okay. And then you did what with that? I threw it in the garbage. Okay. Well, not immediately. No, I just no. wiped her and put it to the side. Just wiped her and threw it down. Yeah. Right next on the TV table. And then you picked her up out of the bed. Uh, yes, and then I put her on the changing table, and then, um, when I was pumping her chest, there was, like, bubbles, like, mm -hmm. bubbles coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I thought maybe that, that's why I thought she choked, and then maybe if I kept pumping, like, it would, like, maybe it would come out, and then she'd, like, cough and wake up. So I just kept wiping the bubbles, and I was giving her air, and giving her, um, pumping with my fingers, just my two fingers. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should have done more. Nope, you are doing it right. And she was still so cold, and I think maybe ten, ten minutes. I don't. It's so hard to gauge time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's not just me the whole time. And he just, he's just asking me if she is she dead? Is she gone? While well, he's crying, just asking me is she gone? And I, it's just so hard to say yes. And I just. I just, I just said, yeah, she's just unresponsive. And then we had no idea what to do then at all. Like, who do, what do we, who do we do? Mm -hmm. And so he called his parents, or he called his dad first, excuse me, and his dad said, okay, your mom and I are on our way. Um, call the police. Let them know what happened, and um, we'll, tr we'll try and get there before they do. And then we just spent the entire time on the couch waiting and crying. We did sleep. It was just my mother in law doesn't like three hours. Mm -hmm. This, again, is false. Seth and Tatiana didn't call the police or emergency services until three hours after finding Mary's body, and they only did so after talking to a lawyer. In the call, Seth didn't seem to be under any emotional duress, so the concept that these two people were extremely distraught rings hollow. Why would we... So, so this morning you found her about nine o'clock, and 
Did you, has that the time you woke up? No. No, I woke up at around 7. The kids are very consistent with their wake up time at 7. Mm -hmm. And and she's always up at 7. Uh, yes. Except when she's going through a growth spurt, she'll sleep in until about 9 or 10. Okay. Which is why I went to check in on her at 9, and I wondered why she wasn't up yet. Okay. But last night when I came home, I, I opened the door just a tad so we could make that noise. And So you finished feeding her at 2.30. Yep. And you put her to bed at 2.30. And that was the last time you saw her because you went to work then. Yeah. Okay. But then you came home at 11.30. And when you opened the door, you saw movement from her. Mm -hmm. You're certain you saw movement Absolutely. from her. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Or else I would have said. So... Did you go any further into that room other than just looking through the door? No. The crack in the door? I did not. Was it the hole in the door or the crack in the door that you looked at? It was a hole in the door. I didn't open the door completely. I just pushed it enough so it would make the noise. It's a very old, creaky door. So I pushed it enough. It makes the noise. It doesn't open the door completely. And she nudges because she hears it. And I just peek at her. I see her moving. And she's... What did you, when you say that you saw her moving, how did you see her move? Can you describe that? She was laying on her back still. Um, her blanket wasn't kicked off, and I only wrapped it right around the knees down to her feet to keep her feet warm. Um, and she had her polar bear, but she likes to play with her polar bear before she goes to bed, so she kicked it off to the side. Um, she was laying on her back. Her head was turned to the left side a bit. So when I um, pushed the door open, she jerked her arm a little and turned her head. So I could see that her eyes were still closed. She was squinting a bit, like, what was that? And then... She Okay, and that's what that's what she does. And what time would that have been? Around 11.30, 11.45, like, we'll just say 11.30. Because so I came home, I was still in my uniform. I came home and I um, brought lemonade home and a burger, and I just set it down at the table, and I looked inside, and I did that, and I... And then I went into the room with Seth. So, when, but, but she went to bed at 3, wouldn't it be odd, wouldn't, wouldn't it be odd, like, for Seth that she's still in bed when he went to bed? Because she's in bed at, I mean, she went to, she went to sleep at 2.30. She's done this before, and so have our other kids, which is why we thought if she's sleeping, we're going to let her sleep. Well, yeah, I mean, I get that, but you you saw her and we saw her, and she's tiny. For over an hour, Tatiana has been telling the police about what a great mother she was, how she worked tirelessly to provide for her children, how she made sure they had enough to eat, and how they were all happy and healthy. She described the home as being a loving environment where the children could learn right from wrong, and she presented herself as a very involved, loving parent. And up until this point in the interview, she has been under the impression that they believed her. She believed that through her ability to lie alone, they would overlook the vermin, insects, and mold in the home. That they would look at the long history of abuse and neglect allegations that they have against them as nothing more than an overreach by doctors and others. She believed that she could make all the evidence that would point to the truth disappear simply because she could lie very well, and she is being told directly to her face that she is wrong. That simple acknowledgement of the fact that Mary's size when she died is a huge blow to Tatiana's confidence. She has two ways forward from this. Either she could double down, attempt to make the evidence against her work in her favor, or she could admit that Mary was having issues, and that the problem didn't appear out of nowhere. Let's see what she does. Tatiana, we're all parents in this room, okay? We, and we all need to be honest. Remember in, in the car when I first talked with you and I told you that at the end of the day, we all need to know exactly Right? Okay. So we need to tell her story. Okay? And I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think for a second and put yourself in our shoes. You're the police officer. You're the police detective. You get called out to that home today. You get called to my home or his home today. 
okay, you the police officer. And then you have to go into that house and you have to look at that, that precious little angel, okay? Do you think she was healthy, honestly? When you look at her signs and you can see every single bone in her body, do you think she was healthy? We know this isn't easy, Tatiana, but we need to know what happened to her. What was going on? But well, when did she start losing all that weight? The past two days. But she, she, she's lost so much weight that you can't lose that much in two days. She, I've never seen a child that skinny. Never. And here's the thing. You're obviously a very concerned mom, but at what point, at what point did you know, what, what, what point did you think something was wrong? You're obviously a very concerned mom. The officer is using the ego up technique to once again establish a connection between himself and Tatiana. By saying that she is a concerned, therefore a good mom, he is trying to get her to align herself with that idea and change her story, which will hurt her credibility should the case go to trial. Because I know that you knew something, or you thought something wrong. You are an intelligent, educated woman. And at some point, you felt something was wrong. At what point did she, she, she can't even weigh eight pounds right now. She doesn't weigh eight pounds. When's the last time that you actually inspected her, that you looked at her? Tell me the truth. Every time when I change her, and I think I just may have been just, just so blinded. And I just, what were you she, blinded by? Because I know, you listen, you are an intelligent artist particular, college-educated, early childhood development, you know. You know when you look at someone that something's wrong. I have a picture of her right here. I'm prepared to show you that tells you no medical treatment, as dumb as I am. I'm not near as intelligent as you. I can't speak the words you can speak. I am not you. And even I can look at this photo and I can say, whoa, something's wrong. It put tears in our eyes when we walked in there. It was that obvious. Tatiana, I'm going to be quite honest with you right now, okay? One parent to another, right? And I'm going to try and control my emotions, all right? I've been to a child death investigator school, and I've seen photos and images of children that have been malnourished. And I'm telling you right now, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh no, really? Yes. Oh. There is something incredibly fake about this reaction. This feels like a response that you would see on a cop procedural, or a show airing on the CW. Her responding, oh no, really, in this way, to being told that this is the worst case of child malnourishment he has ever seen, is incredibly inappropriate to the scenario. She was just told that her nine-month-old, which she claimed weighed 20 pounds, only weighing eight, less than when she was born. That is such an outrageous lie that the interview itself feels incredibly illogical. Again, she is one of the most gifted liars I have featured on this channel, which is disturbing. You, you clearly need help, too, though. <laughs> You're going to okay. be dealing with this. This is baggage. This is something that... But all I want to know is what stopped you from seeking help? You knew something was wrong. What stopped you? Tell us the truth. I mean, are you guys that financially strapped? I mean, what is it? Do you not believe in health care? Do you... I mean, do you have religious beliefs? I mean, what is it? Uh, we do have religious beliefs, and I, we just we were praying about it, and, and we have faith that, that. When did you start praying about it? 
Tatiana only talks about religion now, after it's been asserted by the officer. If the beliefs were the reason they wouldn't go to the doctor or seek any medical intervention, they would have been brought up before. I mean, when she was born, but consistently and, and heavily the past three, three, four days. So three, four days ago, you started praying. What were your prayers? She's not for gaining weight. She's, she's eating wise and it's sticking. Like, why? Like, I, she ate so much. Like, but so why? Why? why it's stick. I have a strong faith as well, a very strong faith, and I think God answers prayers. I'm with you on that. I also think God puts people in places to help people, but we all have our own beliefs. But here's what I'm saying is that you you guys knew enough was wrong to start heavily and consistently praying. Why didn't we seek help? You knew. No, no, no. Say he, anything to Seth. I, Seth had to no. know. He doesn't ever hold her. Yes, but he was also very um, faithful and, and trust in God and, and trusted that, that it would be okay and didn't think we needed to bring her to a doctor. We knew. How, how long did you know this? What the condition? It doesn't happen in three days. It doesn't happen in four days. I think I, I just deluded myself. I just didn't want to believe that. So when did you delude yourself? When did you start? When did this condition start? I think within a month it started to become a little bit up and down. Her cheeks would be full and and bright, and and then a couple of days later she would she would look ill or hungry, and then we're not hungry, just just her cheeks wouldn't be as full as they were. Sunken then. Yeah, and then. So when did you notice that she had other bones showing? About a month. About well, a month ago. Well, let, let me ask you this: When was the last time you bathed her? Oh, um, maybe two weeks ago. So about a month ago, you you notice that her bones are all showing, right? And so, is that when you started happily praying? No, it was it was the past few days because uh, about a month ago it would be like full, and then you know two days later it'd be sunken in, but then within the day it'd be full again. But then the past few days it wouldn't fill up as quickly as as it used as it did. But listen, here's what I'm saying, Mary. Listen. I get that, but her legs were as small as my pointer finger. So you that that didn't happen in three days. No. And I know that you know that, and, and I know that you wanted to get her help, but I'm trying to just figure out when did this happen. I understand that maybe you started seeing some kind of symptoms a month ago, but when when did she consistently? lose all of this weight? When did she consistently become skin and bones? I think it was within the month. Cause so, she, she was always just so, so thin. and So within a month, so then why, when we had a month to look at her like this, why, why didn't we get help? We thought, we thought she'd get better without getting help. How did you think she was going to get better? Eating her and, and, and being with her. Was she really truly eating the way that you were telling us? Yes. I, Be, because, I it, you know, if, if you want, he has a photo of her, and if you want to see it, I mean, she, I'm pretty sure that I explained this to both you and Seth when you were in my car with me. Um, you know, she's, there's going to be an autopsy done. Okay, and there was a medical, uh, a person from the medical examiner's office at the house. Okay. So we're going to know all this, what we're saying. Yeah. But, and, and you're not, you're not a bad person. We get all this, and we get that there's, there's a dynamic here that we're trying to figure out. There is a dynamic here, and I'm going to tell you, I, I know it. I can, I know there's a dynamic, 
and I feel that you wanted to get her help. I'm trying to just figure out why you didn't. What's the dynamic? What am I missing? Because you can't tell me that this Brooklyn, New York, this New York College, City College, Educated Grand Rapids Community College, Early Childhood person didn't know that this girl needed help, but something stopped her. Once again, the police are pushing Tatiana to change her story, this time by implying that she was stopped from helping Mary by her husband. They, of course, do not believe that. Tatiana, by her own admission, was the primary caregiver. She was the one in charge of the feeding, and she spent a significant amount of time with the kids, alone. But getting Tatiana to change her story would again harm her credibility and would get them closer to the truth. I just want trying to figure out what it is. What stood between you and help? I think I was worried about another GPS call from the doctors, and I thought that um, Mary would get better and it would be okay. But at what point did you get better? About two days ago. Not three days ago. Two days ago. So two, three days ago, you thought she wasn't going to get better, so then why didn't we call then? What? Because I thought that I was being doubtful, and I... I I. You thought you thought you were being doubtful of Christ. Yes. I I thought I was uh, lessening in my faith, and I just. Is that what Seth thought, Joe? That I was being doubtful. No, I want to know out of you two, which one, which which one of you wanted to go to take her to the doctor? I know he didn't, and I, I didn't for a long time, and until recently, it just became a little thought in my head that maybe we should, and then I was worried about CPS and about about just losing faith. We've had issues with CPS before, and I just didn't want to lose the kids. So you, you, you thought you thought you lose you thought you were losing faith by thinking you needed to go to the doctor. That yeah, that I wasn't having faith in God to fix this. Mm -hmm. I feel stupid about it now. So, so I'm, that's what we're that's that's what we're trying to figure out. Do you think? And I'm not ridiculing this. I just want to know. Do you guys think that that God doesn't want us to use doctors? No. So you, do you think God puts people in places to help us? Yes, I do. I believe that for sure. And you think doctors could be those people? Yeah. So, all still, I, I, I get what you're saying, but, but this is what I'm telling you. Two days ago, I could have looked at this child and I could have said, this child has hours to live. Two days ago, I could have looked at this child and I, cut, I probably would have thought this child has minutes to live. Two days ago, if I'd have seen this child in your hands, being a stranger at Myra, I'd have snatched this child out of your hands and faced the consequences. That's what I'm trying to reason with is that. You, so, but you didn't, you didn't receive the help and you knew that two days ago, you knew, you just said that, you, that she was probably... What did you say? Beyond help, or whatever it was two days ago. So what? It's not beyond help. I just. At what point? At what point in this illness did you think there's a good chance she's gonna die? I didn't think at all that she was gonna die. I, I just, How could you not think that? Delusional. I, just, I don't have a reason why I couldn't think that. I was just being such a hopeful mom. I suppose that I don't have a good reason for you. Sorry. What was your conversations like with Seth? You said a minute ago that you knew that he didn't want to go to a doctor. Yeah, because well, we discussed it before. That we just just Dis discussed her conditions. Yes. When was the first time you guys discussed that? Maybe a month ago. So a month ago is when. What did you notice a month ago? Because I'm I'm certain you're the one. Because you said that you know Seth didn't want to go. So obviously you're the one that brought up needing to go to the doctor. 
What did you notice a month ago? That she was almost nine months old and just wasn't filling into her clothing like she should and and you know we talked about it and you just just have faith and just we'll keep feeding her like we do and keep nursing her and keep her active and she'll get there it's okay she'll get there but let me ask you something if Seth told you that God told him to sacrifice one of your children would you do it? No. That's what I'm saying, though. I'm, that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. How many conversations did you have with Seth about this? Not very many. I needed to at most, just because we didn't want to worry about it. We... We trust with God, then. Would he get angry talking about it? No, I think he'd be very sure. What would happen, what would he, how would he react if you took him to the, took her to the doctor anyway? I'm not sure. It, something like that has never happened. Um, I'm just asking to speculate. I think he would just be concerned that GPS would be called. But mm -hmm. not angry, just saying, okay, just know that you took to the doctor, expect CPS to come to the house. He, he's not an angry type person? No. How, no. how is he as far as emotional goes? He, uh, he's not afraid to cry, I'm just going to say that. Does he, he cry a lot? Is he, is he a, would you say that he wears his emotions on his sleeve? I suppose. I yeah. mean, I went, when we were going through our, our marriage to the beginning of it, and he was very expressive about how um, about his feelings and, and how he would like to be treated and how I wasn't excuse me, treating him well and and then in return told me he realized that he wasn't being a respectful husband and wasn't treating me well either. So he's very intuitive and he was and expressive, which is rare, I suppose. So Today, at 9 o'clock, you found the deceased. What time were we called? I don't know. I think it was... Was it 11? Yeah, it was like a long time. That, why? We called, we called my in-laws first and... The, t the time that the Sheriff's Department was called to respond to your house was at 12.06. That's when they Three. came or that's when they were called. That's when 911 was called. That's when 911 was called. It was 12 Three 06. hours and six minutes later. My father in law said to wait until um, they were close because they live an hour away to wait until they were close before we called them so wow. we can get there at the same time. That would explain two, that would explain one hour. What about the other two hours and six minutes of waiting? I think that we were in such a state of shock that we just didn't know what to do. Well, let me ask you this. Did you ever look at how tiny and sunken and skeletal she looked and say, we're in trouble? Yeah, I think actually it came across my mind today. Did you guys have a discussion about him? No. Did he say anything to you about that? No. Did you? Why, ever, why, why did it come across your mind? What were you thinking? Is that why it took so long to call 911? I've, I've never worked a case that's taken that long to call 911. This has just never happened before or with anyone we knew or we waited for a response from my father-in-law mm -hmm. to see what his advice was. We had no idea what to do. And he said, yes, we should call the police. They're on our way. Wait until we're close. But but even even by um, your father-in-law, he wasn't even called until around approximately 
10.30 to 10.45. So we're still looking at an hour and a half. It may have been after 9 then because that is a very long time and it did not feel that long at all. It must have been just before 10 then. I'm sorry if I, if I gave you the no, wrong no, time. No, no, no. You, you're not yeah. expected to, to, to check your watch every time you go check something. We're not holding you to all those times. I know it was before 10, but it was definitely after 9. That is an excessively long time to just stand around there. That's, so so all right, let's, let's even just give the benefit of the doubt and say it's 10. Okay. But it's 10 o'clock. So, because like you said, you know it was before 10, but we'll just play it safe and say it was 10. Okay. And... So 10 o'clock rolls around, you, 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 you check everything, you did CPR for about 10 minutes, according to what you told me. So then what what did you do for the next two hours? Because um, that's still... That's, well, we waited. Yeah. Um, before you called us, you waited for two hours before we got called. We waited for my in-laws to come. We were trying to contact them. And then we, we got a response. Um, well, we were trying to contact them. Was that like a long process to get all of them? I actually don't know. I'm sorry. I was just, I was just, uh, Seth was the one I contacted them. I didn't. Oh, I see. So I don't know how long it took, if any time at all. I was just very, um, just very struck. So you said you slept. What else, what other kind of house cleaning did you do? Because you said your mother-in-law doesn't like a dirty house. <laughs> um, the kids. Just to distract them, I just had them clean their room, put your toys away, and... Did they know what was going on? We told them, but I don't... Mm -hmm. I... So then they cleaned their rooms, and then what did you and Seth do? Slept, and then we hugged and cried. And we just sat on the couch and just, just were silent. Yeah, but, you know, there's just some odd thing. Obviously, you know, you know this case is odd. And you never once expressed to Seth that, hey, this doesn't, this isn't good. Look at her. Look at her. No, I didn't. Did he ever, did he ever even make a comment about her body? You guys, he looked at her and he never, he never said anything about it? You know how he described her to us on the phone? I can you can listen to the nine one one. He described her as nope, she's dead as a doornail. He gets he gets like that when he's very, very upset. He's just just distraught and he The reason I have put the security camera from Seth's room throughout this interrogation in the top left corner is because I think it's imperative that we see his reaction, the one where he thinks no one is watching and therefore will not matter. He has been walking around, going on his phone, laughing on a call with his lawyer. His callous demeanor on the 911 call and his lack of reaction here is not in line with a person who is trying to distance himself from what happened or who is expressing his grief in an uncommon, inappropriate way. There is genuinely no evidence that he cares about what happened to his child, or is being adversely affected by this development. Tatiana trying to validate the behavior and say it's just his way of going through things is about as effective as saying she was a good, attentive mother. I cry, and yeah, he cries, but he tries to be strong for everyone. Let me ask you a question. You had been through some training, or early childhood development schooling and stuff like that, correct? Yeah. Did you ever receive or go through any kind of like CPR training or, or anything like that? I have, yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. If you were driving down the road, kids are in the back seat in their car seats, and you're driving down the road, and you witness a car accident, what what are you going to do? And, and there's people that are bloody there at the scene. What are you going to do? I... And my kids are with me in the car. Mm -hmm. Well, I, if there's a safe screen to pull over, I'd pull over. I would check to see if anyone's responsive, and then I'd call the police so I can let them know what was going on. And if there's something I could do, I'd, I'd try it. But I know that if there's any sort of injury that I'm not familiar with, I can't move the body. Okay, so you know that you can call 911, right? Yes. So then why not call 911 immediately when your child's not moving? That's what I don't understand. I think because it happened to me personally, I was just, it was my, my little girl, I just, it's 
shock. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you. I was just so never could imagine that could happen. J Jason and I have been doing this a long time, and I understand, and I've seen it time and time again, everybody deals with stress and reacts to things differently. But if there's one thing that I've, I've seen in the course of, of doing this job for a long time is there's usually never a hesitation to pick up the phone and call 911. That is a pretty ingrained, basic. rapid, basic, life-saving response that is ingrained in everybody, especially in our country because of our emergency medical system that we have. When and did you first teach your kids about 911? When did, I'm when did you first teach your children about 911? Um, less than a year ago. Okay. So when you're doing CPR, you don't scream to Seth, call 911. No. And I, well, and I know that that's like the second step or the first, the first step actually. Did you think by calling 911 that he would think your faith was less? No, not at all, actually. I, okay. We just, he called his dad first. Yeah. Wiping the spit up from her face, and then he went to contact his parents. I don't know how long that took. I was just, just <laughs> after she wasn't responding, I was just sitting there rocking her. I don't know for how long. I, I have no idea for how long. And then... After he got off the phone with his dad, um, his dad said, okay, wait until we are close, So and then call the police so we can get there at the same time they do, so we can help with any anything, I suppose, legally. So, so um, the two-plus hours of time that went by from discovery till 911, all, all I know, and I'm just asking if you can think of anything else, all I know of is 10 minutes of CPR and sitting on the couch and sweeping the house. Is there any other activity that occurred? Again, some of the stuff is just so weird, we're just trying to make sense of it. I understand. I, if I were in your position, I, I, would, I wouldn't understand it either, and I'm having trouble gauging it as well. As well. I, I spent quite some time just holding her and just, just rocking her and then I put her back down on her bed and I put, put her blanket on her and then I just checked on the kids make sure they were clean in the room and then Did you put any additional clothing on her when you put her back in the crib? No I didn't. So what was in the crib is exactly what was in there. You didn't change anything. Oh I'm sorry by clothing I just assumed you meant what she was wearing on her. That was left on her. I added her. I covered her up fully, and I added her little head, her little head blanket. You? What do you mean? You covered her fully with clothing or oh, a with blanket? with a gray blanket. Okay. Was that blanket in the crib prior or not? Yes, up to her knees. I, I put it. I wrap it around her knees, down to her feet, just so there's no more chance of over the head pulling. Yeah. She's never done that before. Anyway. And what about this thing that you were talking about, the head pillow or whatever? Where was that? It at? was just a comfy blanket. It was on the side on the rocking chair. I just watched. So that's the only thing that wasn't in the crib, was that one? Yeah. And she had her polar bear in there, but it was by her feet. So, um, when you were going through school, Jason was talking about the, the hitting on the CPR and stuff like that. Did you receive, what other kind of like developmental training did you receive getting your education in, in childhood development? Um, physical. Nutrition. Uh, yeah. All that. Um, so, I mean, what yeah. else? Lesson, or, I'm sorry, uh, meal plans. Um, in terms of how much, that's why I should be eating. And I was, I was happy with how much she was eating. She was eating so much. It's like, this is such a surprise to me. And is there an actual condition that prevents weight gain? Did you ever Google that? No. Maybe. And maybe I did and I didn't find anything. But I, I would I would probably know and, and if a doctor was You would have found a lot, I think, if you Googled it. I think you'd I think you'd have found a lot on that. 
me ask you this. Do you think that you realize too much on WebMD and, and Google as a parent instead of actually going to a doctor? It's just an opinion question. I'm, I'm just curious. I do. Because you, 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 you've kind of brought that up a couple times, and I'm just wondering. If I, like, replace it? What, yeah, I mean, do you kind of try to self-diagnose your children instead of taking them to a doctor? You just look oh. it all up on WebMD and Google and try and figure it out yourself? or No, I do that more for myself. Um, the only thing I actually to feed whatever age she was at at the time to help her gain more weight. Um, and, you know, potatoes, et cetera. So when you were going through early childhood development education, was that to be a teacher or a preschool teacher or daycare owner, operator type? That's, that's for, right? Yeah, it was, it was to be a, a preschool teacher. So I know, I know I'm sure this was addressed. So what are some of the things they, they told you to look out for if you did have a student that came to school and, and had a um, failure to thrive type case? Not eating. Um, what physical characteristics? Thin. Bones. Like sunken in cheeks? Ribs. Ribs showing. Thin arms. Yeah. Did you see those things in your own child? Yes. So when you went through this education and you were, you, and they, they told you to look out for that stuff, what, what was supposed to be your plan of action if you ever saw a child come to school like that? It's called Child Protective Services. Because you had a what to report? You'd have a duty, right? Yes. Did you, so, so, but you didn't help your child? But, but two, two to four days ago, you knew it was really bad. Tuesday. Tuesday, you knew it was really bad. And so that is what prompted you more than ever to be checking and looking to make sure she wiggles when you move a door and because of how she looks. Every day, regardless, that matters. Okay, yeah, it does matter, absolutely. Every, every day, every night. No, no, nobody, Tatiana, for, for one second, I don't want you to think that anybody is trying to say that you didn't love your child. No. Okay, but I am going to be blatantly honest with you. You didn't pro provide the necessary care for your daughter. You, you didn't. Do you and think you did? And we're just trying to figure out why. Do, do you think you did right? It's a very hard question to answer because she's dead. She'll know that I tried. I fed her so But what much. stopped you? Tr truly, what stopped you? From what? Fr from, get from getting her help a month ago. Was it embarrassment? Was it fear? Was it... I mean, I think, what was it? I think it was, it was fear of CPS. I, I think that I just thought that I was overreacting, and it was just all in my head because I, I, I tend, I tend to, to overthink things when it's not necessary, and I just thought there was another one of those. Mm -hmm. And our other two children are just so healthy, and or am I delusional about that too? Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't as know. far as they appear, I mean they. What? But here's the difference, though. It, it, you just said it right there. You just said it. As far as they appear, but we know they don't appear healthy. So that, it's not a delusion. It's an observation that your other two children clearly appear healthy, right? And clearly didn't. That's comparing apples and oranges. So it shows that your observations were working. You weren't delusional. You know that these two are here, Holly, and this one then. So we need to go and get this one fixed. Figure out what's wrong with her. I don't have more time for her to, to fill out. 
Mm-hmm. Well, let What's me ask you this: chicken? Did did you did you plan on having each of your children? No. No. Oops. We knew we were having unprotected unprotected sex, and we knew we were going to have a baby from it. We just weren't saying, okay, this day we're going to make the child, and she will be born this day. Right. But real. Tasha, we I have to we have to step out real quick though. Can we get you a water or anything? Well, uh, we're just going to just slide over real quick and talk to Seth oh, and yes, just confirm some I'm of the sure, stuff. I'm sure you guys. He's have probably to he's sitting on ice right now, probably wondering what in the world's going on. So, do you need to use the restroom as well? Um, I, I suppose I should. It's been quite some time. All right, just just know we'll get you some water while you're using the bathroom. I'll walk you to the bathroom. I'll get you some water. Just know that we're going to be down. We're, we're, so as long as we've been in here with you. You're probably going to be sitting in here. We're going to be down there talking to him. So that way, at least you're not wondering what's going on. It's just we're talking to him, trying to get his side of this now, okay? Are we in trouble? We don't, no, we don't know that. You guys are going home the same way you came. We told you that. You're yeah. not being arrested. All we're doing is we're just information gathering. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that, no, you're not in trouble, because I don't know that yet. It has, this whole case has to still be reviewed. There's a whole process that has to go through. Um, he put her letter down real quick. We're going to get another detective in here to, to, to escort you down there real quick, okay? Uh, just just because it's a secure facility, Larry. Just, all right. Okay. All right. That was Tatiana's interview. Now let's look at Seth's. Man, sorry about that. We're in there with Tatiana. She's taking a while to get through it. So. Let me give her a chance. Seth is already cold and standoffish. He barely acknowledges the police officers, and it seems he feels somewhat slighted because he had to wait to speak to them while they talked to his wife first. The officers now have to start building a rapport with him and try to get him to trust them and confide in them in the way Tatiana did. Jason. This is my my sergeant, same name, Jason. Different last name. Seth, I wanna talk. I had been I wasn't in on when you guys are speaking. I'd like to just get some background information just on your marriage, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you're gonna doing that. I know earlier you talked to these guys in a car and they advise of your rights. Just due to the simple fact that we're sitting in the sheriff's front of your room. Those same rights still apply. Do you remember those rights? Do you want me to read them to you again? Was the card that they shown to your court the same card as this? I'll stick that in front of you just as a refresher so you have them if you need them. But, um, I'm sorry you're going through this. I told you that earlier. But how long have you and T- is it Tantiana, right? I was, I keep it Tatiana. Tatiana. How long have you guys been married? Uh, I don't know how long we've been married for, like three years. Um, uh, March 2015, I think. Okay. We've been together um, since September 2011. Okay, and are all of your children your guys' children? Okay. Can you tell me about the birth? I mean, like. So, just where was she born? Oh. Uh, Why I am very anti-medical industry is because of uh, what happened with her birth. Um, she coughed one time, uh, and uh, so they said that they had to keep her under observation for 72 hours to make sure she didn't have a breathing problem. She didn't have a breathing problem. She coughed one time to clear some birth fluid out of her lungs. Right. And they kept us under observation for 72 hours. Um, All while you're paying for it. Of course, yeah, the bill was about fifteen thousand dollars. So, mm-hmm. um, so that was kind of um, that was kind of a kick in the rear. Uh, and then afterwards, we had some problems where I actually had a doctor uh, make a fraudulent CPS claim and I actually forged paperwork and stuff like that. And I tried to make a complaint about it, but nobody listens. That was also Tatiana and Seth explained the birth story the exact same way likely because this has been repeated in their history since it happened. The doctors wanting to observe their daughter 
to make sure she didn't have a breathing problem being a farce, and the fraudulent CPS report is something they have likely shared with others, trying to make a point about how horrible the medical industry is and exonerate themselves from their negative behaviors. The couple is aligned in their belief that any reporting to CPS has been inaccurate and false, and characterize it as such, even when sitting across from two police officers investigating their daughter's death due to their neglect. Well, more of a uh, get-rich scheme, wasn't it? Kind of yeah. like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some money off from a product that someone really doesn't need. Yes. And he issued two separate pieces. Um, flavors, I don't, forms of paperwork. One that had a bunch of notes on it saying all sorts of bad healthcare things we were doing wrong with the with, with yes person, and the copy of the paperwork he gave to us that said she was fine. So um, so that was that was about my last straw with it. Um, was, that, was that to do with the helmet? And is yeah. that all, so it all started with, if I'm right, it all started with the helmet. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, I'm not I'll start with the cough, but yeah. the, the, um, to the helmet. I, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the immunization stuff, and so I kind of balked against that, and they didn't like that either. Um, you know, they even got to the point where they, um, the first time we changed doctors, they called CPS on us just for changing doctors, because the doctor we were seeing was all the way in Byron Center. I can't emphasize how untrue the statement is. Seth is operating from the standpoint that every negative thing that has happened to him or his family has been someone else's doing, that he is somehow the victim in every part of his life. Doctors reporting the family to Child Protective Services is not because they are seeing signs of abuse, but because they want to make sure the children are well taken care of. It's because they are terrible people who are mad that he is such a free thinker. People who think this way are incredibly difficult to talk to and reason with, because they refuse to empathize with anyone and they are after anyone else's point of view. They cannot conceptualize them being at fault. So when they talk about situations where their actions are called into question, they make up flimsy, unbelievable excuses that are easily fact-checked and disputed. All he is doing is confirming the pattern of child abuse that Tatiana already established before. And just like her, he is unable to see that he has done that. From Cedar Springs. So they called CPS on us because we changed the actors and didn't give them enough notice. Or didn't give who enough notice? So, um, you know, we have... I'm done with medical stuff. We're home birthing. Uh, it's... It's the way to go anyways, isn't it? Yeah, we were... It, they... <laughs> so I heard it's like, yeah, a, hey, I'm coming, whether you're ready or not. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so, yeah, so there you go, that, that's about. So. You would think that losing a child mere hours before, a child that you purport to love, that Seth would reconsider his stance on modern medicine. You would think, at the very least, he would express some form of regret for not providing his child with medical attention and feel some kind of guilt over that, but he simply doesn't care. He is flippant, shrugging his shoulders as if to say, it is what it is, about his beliefs about medicine and his child being dead. Oh. And you know, and I, and that's kind of what uh, Tatiana explained too is that she was going to immunization. She was with, a, and everything was kind of okay. But uh, there was both of you had done some research and you weren't too keen on uh, immunizations. And then come along the helmet. Mm -hmm. You guys wanted to get a uh, second opinion on the helmet, so. Mm -hmm. You don't need anything, uh, and so you chose not to get a helmet, and then that's kind of when the CPS referral came along, mm -hmm. the failure to thrive uh, type referral, if, that's, mm -hmm. if this is sounding correct. Mm -hmm. um, and then you guys... Um, and you remember... Was born. Yeah, she's, um, well, I guess I had it refreshed today. I, I guess from what Tatiana said, she's 14 ounces. So. And then how, how much, um, seven, two. 
And were they all about the same length? Right? They're all the same size. They're the same. They're, 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 I was born to. Oh, yeah. 21 inches, like it, we're all the same. Yeah. And then. Like exactly the same? Mm -hmm. Wow. What's the odds of that? Yeah, and she was even earlier, too. That's why I just didn't. It never, you know, bothered me too much that she was skinny because she was. She came out. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you. Annie, when did it first, when did it, like, dawn on you that she's thin? Oh, just when she came out. I mean, she's she been thin. Yeah. But now, um, Tatiana, was, it, was she going to labor? She had just been up pacing around all night, and then baby started sliding out. And things are a lot easier when you do them at home, I'll tell you what. Well, yeah, uh, you don't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and the position they put you in in the hospital is very... Bad medicine, just whatever. What position are you at home? And you just stand up. Do you really? Yeah, and the gravity just shoots the baby right now. You don't mean they don't have you up facing upward, pushing against the gravity makes no sense. Um no, it actually wouldn't make sense if you think about it. it yeah. I never seen it. So you the other officer offers Seth some light pushback, nothing incredibly demeaning or hurtful, and Seth immediately deflates. He sighs, leans back, and is clearly annoyed that his own ideas are being pushed down. I don't know why this officer would state that when trying to build rapport, especially because Seth seems a bit narcissistic. But let's continue. Well, you have to just kind of be under there, like, you're, you're like the quarterback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 On that day? Yeah, she she got up there. She got up there. Um, uh, you know, she was late for the delivery. She checked over the baby, said she's healthy. And, you know. Is that what she do does with a midwife? They kind of tie off their tubes or whatever it is they have to do? And... They just, they, <laughs> yes. They do the dirty work that anybody could do. It's just a lot, a lot of us aren't, not, <laughs> yeah, a lot of us aren't willing to do it. But, yeah, really what they, I mean, they, you know, they mop up the blood and, yeah. You know, they go over, like, you know, your check sheet of, check this to see if the baby's out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. And then do, do they do all the recording of birth, or is that something you guys do, or? I, I, I think-ish. Yeah, it seems like they would. My, my wife kind of deals with more of the paperwork. paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. so you said that, so you weren't concerned about, about her being skinny? get comments that she's bigger than some six-year-old boys now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, same size, skinny, but she, it just took a while, and then after, like, you know, after, I think it was about ten months to a year, she started really putting on weight, and, you know, and now she's, you saw her. Yep, yep. And and she, she didn't need a helmet. Her head looks just fine. Yeah. So, um... Seth truly believes that his eldest daughter, who is also incredibly malnourished and had resorted to eating dirt and grass, is fine and healthy. But was um, Tatiana working? No. So, so Tatiana was home, and she did all the feedings, yeah. right, right from the source. Huh? Um, if if Tatiana went to Meyer. And that was in case she needed to latch on? Yeah. Type thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, because with the other two, Tatiana would leave a food source at home because she was working some. Um, oh, yeah. When she would go to um, the farmer's market for our farm produce business. Um, but last year, which is last year, we did that. She took both kids with her pretty much every time. Okay. Uh, Where I couldn't go to market anymore, so I stayed home. Stay home work on the farm. Yep. So, um, so feeding the children has never been a real part of your response. Like, more. Well, I've been like I've been feeding like her her dinner. Uh, you know, I feed her tons of solid food. I feed her 
three or four of those, you know, those Gerber cups. Uh, yeah. And she just wolfed them right down, no problem. Were you were you guys buying chocolate or making chocolate? Both. Okay. What what were you making? If we made anything, it was just like sweet potatoes, grind it up, and yeah, yeah, she made them. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what she what she was saying is um, what she could recall is is uh, like some vegetables out of your garden. Oh, yeah. Maybe whatever it was you had growing at that time. Yeah. And then she'd throw something, or maybe breast milk, to make the vegetables more palatable. Pal- 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 whatever that word is. Palatable. Yeah. And then she would make like a little fruit smoothie, maybe some blueberries, some some nuts, okay. like that. And then she did take out potatoes and stuff like that. When did you when did you guys start with her on solid foods? It's been a couple months now. Um, since the beginning of summer. Okay. Okay. I would I would want to say maybe since since April because that's when Tatiana started working at her job. So basically we were only gonna let her was eating solid foods. Yeah, just yeah, fine. Yeah. So I, th- I would say April. Okay. And then that was supplementing nursing mm-hmm. with solids. Mm-hmm. Has has nursing has solids ever completely taken over? Is nursing was nursing still She okay. still nurses, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so what would you say was her primary? A nursing or the solids? Or we we can't say that. I can't scientifically say. I'd say probably at this point we were really working on trying to make it more solid food only, especially because my wife's pregnant again. So, um, you know, and how that all works. Um, I do know how that works. Right. So, <laughs> so you know, you're trying to um, get her Try over to just be on solid. Yeah. So you're, you're more familiar with this than me with having younger kids. Typically at what age is it that they switch over to solids? Um, do you remember? Nope. Nope, me neither. Uh, do you remember? We don't. Yeah. I, I thought it was when they started teething, but... I bet you all of our lives know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're supposed to, I, I think you're, you're supposed to transition it in starting at, like... Uh, starting at six months, you're supposed to transition it in. And then by two years old, the kids are supposed to be. Okay. All right. Off the teeth. Off the teeth. So, um... So, I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> Tatiana. I'm sorry. I'm, no worries. That, that's my mistake. Tatiana would work, and, and when she started working, she started with fewer hours. She started working mm-hmm. four hour shifts, I think it was. Yeah, like three, four days a week, yeah. And then she moved up to now she's working. Full, basically full time. Was it like three, oh, three to three to eleven? Three to eleven, yeah. 11 okay. So when did that begin? Remember? About when ish? July 4th. Okay. So starting July 4th, did more of the responsibilities of me? Yeah, I guess so. So from 3 p.m., because I know obviously when uh, Tatiana was there and she she would nurse her, uh, did she leave you bottles of breast milk to nurse her or did you not nurse? No, we just had, uh, that's when I would give her solid food. Okay. So... Well, she would leave work two thirty m ish, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. And how many times? Um, but what the normal schedule is is Tatiana puts baby down at two thirty. I've got some time to like kind of let my brain simmer down because uh, work get up and work in the morning. Yeah. So let my brain have some time to simmer down. Kids have quiet time. And then they're up again by like four thirty five and then I'm up with or I might feed her two of the cups, take her out for a half hour, walk around to the food settles, and then come back and feed her the rest and then take her outside for like an hour, hour and a half. Then bring her back and, and put her back down. So the dinner time is fine. Yeah, it, it was nothing too. We're not too, um, you know, regulated. We're not too right. uh, uptight. But um, yeah, generally, you know, she'd get up. Let's just say general timing would be up again. You know, four thirty to five. Um, you know, she'd eat five thirty, be back in bed by like six thirty. 
Okay. And then, uh, should we back about it at 6.30 and then when was the next feeding? Um, a, lot, a lot of times I think that's probably my wife breastfeeds her at night. Oh, when so, you get home from work? Yeah, okay. so I, I wouldn't really know about that. Because um, you usually be on bye bye then? <laughs> so, um, hey, the morning's on the farm? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so my wife, my wife might breastfeed her in the middle of the night, um, you know, or, you know, breakfast time when she gets up again. So, typically speaking, that that dinner meal would be the, because then she would sleep till your wife got home. And so that would be the, your, the last, so you have to just feed her really once. Once. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if she wanted to goof off a little bit before feeding, she might split that once up into twice. So, at, at what point um, did you guys become concerned about her weight? This is the first confrontation in this interview. Let's see how he responds to this direct kind of confrontation. Um, okay, so it's always kind of it's it's always kind of been there. It's always been something that we've watched. Um, however, it never I'll say it never seemed to cause because it never it never did. Um, but I just know you guys are watching my words, so um, it never caused her. Let's put it this way. She never was sickly in any way, mm -hmm. slow, lethargic, um, no, no, no health indicators right. that said anything was wrong other than that she was skinny, which I just, I, re I didn't, I, I just didn't let it get to me, um, because like I said, very skinny, um, she started putting on weight recently, we really started really, you know, in the, uh, the solid food down in the last like month or so, really make sure she gets some chicken, potatoes, cheese, stuff. Prior to the confrontation, Seth was more than happy to talk about a variety of subject matter he wasn't incredibly informed on. But when asked a simple question about when did you notice your nine-month-old was only eight pounds, a size that is much closer to a newborn than an infant, he begins stuttering. He isn't sure of himself, even though the question is a simple one. I want to take this time to point out that Seth has still not mentioned anything about not seeking medical treatment for faith-based reasons. Um... So and when you started putting the high protein, how, how recently was that? Month or two. Okay. And because um, that's what Tatiana said is that a, a, probably the last month or two is when you guys actually became a little concerned about the weight. Yeah, and but I kind of was like, because my mom's always been honest about it. Um, always. She's always on it. Get get some food in this kid. Yeah, she always like, yeah, oh, wait, are you guys feeding her? Come on, go look at the garbage. And I was like, I can't feed the kid enough. Right. Uh, she just, um, when was the last time your mom was on you about it? But that's well, here's the thing. Here, exactly. Here's the thing. The last time my mom said something about it, she said that she. Wait. Oh, okay. So that's why. I was so you thought you were in the right direction. When was that? Last week. Last week, Sunday. Not this last Sunday, the one before that. Yes. Okay. And you were at your mom's, or she was at your place. She was at our house. And she thought that she was she was gaining weight. She no, she remarked that her cheeks seemed a lot fuller. Okay. I don't remember that specifically. So. so so a month or two ago, you two became concerned and started putting some proteins to her, some chickens and cheeses and whatever, just just trying to bulk her up a little mm -hmm. bit. And and did you believe it was starting to work? I seem to definitely notice. That she was getting heavier. Um, Tatiana mentioned it to me. My mom mentioned it to me. So I would say yes. So Tatiana thought she was she was getting healthier too, and that she was mm -hmm. getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, she's always been growing long. She's just never put the meat like that's not, She's just yeah. never put the meat on. Right. Right. Yeah. So Tatiana, I was correcting this is wrong. Tatiana said that, and, and Kelly said that, especially about the last month. You guys became concerned that you started uh, very um, consistently and um, regularly. regularly, hardly praying over, Lord, help her gain weight. What, does that sound right? I get, I, you know, I don't, um, she may have. I haven't really been so much, okay. um, but I'm glad to hear she was. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so, you guys, you, you, when she started losing her weight, 
taught me that it was just a growing spurt, and, and she had lost weight, and so she was good. And um, is that what is that what you attributed her her? Uh, I'm sorry, not the weight loss, the sleeping to a uh, growth spurt. Is that what you attributed it to? Oh, yeah. Honest, I think maybe three times in the last week where she slept so long I had to like nudge Tatiana and make some jokes now that I would... Yeah, I don't know. You know, um, but you don't really think what? too much of it at the time. Um, mm-hmm. um, so, uh, sorry. No, um, sorry. It's all right. So yeah, there's been a couple. There's been a couple mornings where, then, uh, where she was, she had been sleeping for 15, 16 hours straight, and you know, Tati just went and woke her up. She woke right up. Oh, look who's a hungry baby kind of thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so today when it happened, I didn't really think anything of it differently. I just thought it was oh, another sleepy baby. You know, she was, especially you know, my wife like keeps her up all morning, so she's just exhausted sometimes by the time she goes to bed and. You know, if, if she doesn't, if she doesn't make a peep, if she doesn't make a sound, or if she's, if she's in there, and you know everything, as far as I know, everything is fine when she's put down. I mean, I'm not inclined to wake the kid up. Right, sure. Um, but so, do, I, do you bathe? Uh, did you ever bathe? I didn't know. Do you ever change a diaper? Oh yeah. When was the last time they figured you changed? It might have been yesterday morning. Because I'm trying to imagine when Tatiana goes to work from from leaves at two thirty. Oh, usually when she gets up to eat, I would change her diapers. Then you got daddy to do. You uh-huh. change the diapers and stuff. Yeah. But Seth, here's the thing: is that she's so tiny. Was it? Was there never a time that you just like, well, there's something really wrong? There was never a time where I thought there was something really wrong. Um, I did say to Tatiana, you know, hey, um, you know, with her being the age she is, let's really try to see if, like, the protein, um, the, the fat and the protein it, as her digestive system is developed, let's see if that kicks things into gear, and if not, you know, let's go see a doctor. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she's, she's a skinny little girl. When did you have that conversation? I don't know, two weeks ago. Yeah, you because know, even at that point I was just a little, yeah, but, you know, you probably gonna hurt. So how much, uh, two weeks ago, how much did you figure that she weighed? I don't know. Well, I know she's the same size now, smaller, bigger. I don't know. Okay. Um. So so today, tell me about today. It's incredibly clear by Seth's body language and his tone that he is incredibly annoyed about having to talk about this. He isn't emotional and he isn't upset about losing his child. He is pissed that he has had to sit here for two whole hours and now he has to talk more about this. His body language is that of a kid who has been sent to the principal's office. Um... Yeah, you know, I just kind of like woke up like a regular day. I wasn't feeling very well last night. Um, so I kind of, I, I slept in because I didn't sleep very well. Um, um, I, I think I rolled out of bed like 8 to 8.30, took care of some chores, uh, and then I laid back down. Um, and then my wife told me she was uh, going to go right up the street to the neighbor's house to go get some kids. Uh, and when she came back, I woke up, and then I guess she decided, you know, tell me. And that's that. So, so then, what did you do when she told you that? I had split out of bed and raced to the room. And, you know, so you're helpless, right? Like, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Yeah. I could, I, I could, I could tell she was dead from looking at her. Um, but Tatiana couldn't. She's a mom. Right. She's good. So, yeah. um, I'm used to dealing with a lot of dead bodies, but the farm. Yeah. So, 
So I know what they look like. Um, that was that. He just ended talking about how he found his daughter dead by saying, so that was that. He absolutely does not care about his children. He does not care that his daughter has died. And he thinks that having to talk about it is a waste of time and that the police are just fucking with him. Well, what did Tatiana do? She tried to do CPR. <laughs> so, were you... Sorry. Were you in there when she was doing you in the same room with her when she was trying CPR? Yeah, I uh, yeah. And then what were you doing? She's the one who knows how to do all that kind of stuff, right. so I was just, I was looking and uh, watching and, um, just thinking about what to do, thinking about, you know, just trying to think about what to do next. So what did you do next? Call my dad. Okay, and then, what did you tell your dad? If, um, I don't know what to do. What, what did he say? Well, I, I kind of figured I was supposed to call the police, um, I just, I, I don't know. I don't have any experience with it now. Sure, sure. Um, well, right. I did that, I do now. Um, right. So I, I just called him and, you know, said, hey, hey, should I, should I call the police or, or what? I don't I don't know how this works. Um, and he said, yeah, um, you know, we'll be on the way. Um, you know, call them when, when we get there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it had been about an hour and some change, and I was starting to get impatient because I did not want to, I know, I know how it looks when people wait to make a police call, so I, so, you know, I just... Mm -hmm. So you called prior to your... So I, so I got a patient, I called my wife, are you, are you guys here yet? Because it's, you know, it's like 11.05 now, I don't want to, I don't, I knew that was going to be a process too, so mm -hmm. I wanted to get things going. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they were in Cedar uh, at the gas station, and just, um, they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll be there, and so then I called you guys. So, um, yeah, because obviously you, you're an intelligent man, so you know, obviously for us, and you just said yourself, it looks weird, right? That, but you, I'm saying you didn't know what you're doing, but in our world, we deal with this a lot, because we don't know every single person in the county and everyone's personalities. Sure. And, sure. Um, and I would have, I wanted to just like call you guys first, but I, I, I was following my legal advice. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry if that is a problem at all. I just, uh, just do what the lawyer told me to do. No, nope. well, here's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm just telling you, I'm just confirming what you said. It looks weird. You know, is that, is, is that all? We're not, like, saying that you did something horrible in those two hours. We're just saying that, you, you know, it's not, the, it's not the norm. So, sure. um, so what did you guys do during the two hours? I sat there and cried. Yeah. Tatiana called it her job. Yeah. We knew guests were coming. Did you clean anything up? Yeah, we cleaned up the house a little bit. Um, Why was that? It was a mess. Uh, I knew we were going to have my parents over. <laughs> um, so, um, so, um, getting after you yeah, after so, um, yeah, so, you know, we like. So, what uh, all the house cleaning at that? Um, wiping up the counter and sweeping the floor. Okay. How'd the kids handle it? They don't really get it. Um, they don't really get it. So, but so here's the thing. Looking back, you can't even weigh eight pounds right now. She only she only eight pounds. Okay. I don't know if she weighs six pounds. She, 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 I mean, she's tiny. Was that never an alarm for you? Was there never an alarm like man? She's not where she needs to be. This is, I mean, I can see all of her bones. Mm -hmm. Well, what I just told you is, what I just told you in regards to that matter, um, I, um, so yes, there was, which is what I told you. I also generally, um, I don't, um, I don't trust the medical system so much as other people. So when it says, oh, it, it needs to be this, 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 like I said, you know, I had a doctor was mutant and needed a head shaping helmet. 
uh, I was told that she was underway um, fraudulently. I, I just I know how they work and I know they're they're in business um, and that healthy people don't like them any money. Um, so so that that kind of skewed your yeah it skew it skewed the way it does it changes the way that we do things a lot differently than most other people. Um, but looking at your daughter, looking back, you as a parent, as a father, didn't you have any concern for her looking at her? Yes, I did. But you just didn't think it was concerned the medical field could fix? One, uh, I would say somewhat. Two, I, I'm, I was kind of more in that I have never encountered a health problem where basically if you don't do the right things and be patient that it works itself out. Um, especially with the kids, um, I get as we get older, there's there's other things. Um, I was not happy about how thin she was, but I also I also you know have the belief that um, you know God didn't make us all you know the same. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of chalked it up to that. I was not I was not happy about how skinny she was. That's why if you look in the house. Um, you can see all the baby food that's potatoes with chicken and cheese and all, all, everything matches up with what I'm saying. Um, I guess I... Uh, Did your she was always very healthy. She was never sick. She answered that one. The first time that God is mentioned in line with Seth's belief is when he says that he simply believed that his daughter was extremely malnourished and underweight because God makes people in different shapes and sizes. He says this while emphasizing his issues with the medical system and more because a doctor previously stated that their children were malnourished, which he believes is untrue, despite the position he is in now. Yeah, so it, so it never, if she had been sickly in any way, it, it would have been, okay, that's it. She's sickly and skinny, but she was always just skinny. But, but Seth, that, that's where I'm going to disagree with you, okay? I, I'm a parent. I'm a father. I have three children. Mm -hmm. He's a father. You're a father, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm just being honest with you, okay? Because I don't know how to be anything other than, okay? And I'm telling you right now, I've been doing this job for a long time, okay? And he'll tell you when I walked in that bedroom today, all right, I started crying, okay? I looked at that little baby, and I looked at her for a millisecond, mm -hmm. and I knew that she wasn't right, and I knew that she wasn't right for some time, okay? And you're her father. Yes. And I'll tell you, I, I saw her when she was dead, too. She's she's very, she was much more gaunt when she was dead than she ever was when she was alive. I mean, I got, I got pictures on my phone. I, I, I'm... Right, but, but when, let me ask you this. When's the last time you saw that baby without any clothes on in a bath? Me? I, I've never I've never given her a bath. Okay, when, when, so, but you, you changed her diaper mm -hmm. maybe a day, day and a half ago, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not putting words in your mouth. You said that, correct? Mm -hmm. How did you not, when you looked at her a day and a half ago changing her diaper and realize that my daughter is skin and bones. When I looked at her belly in the house, okay, and I'm not exaggerating this. Uh, I know. I could see the outline of her intestines through her stomach. I could see her spine completely through her back. I could see every one of her ribs through her chest. Yeah, I, like I said, I mean, like a... Uh, like I said, I'm not happy about it either. Um, you know, you're welcome to go through my garbage and look at the baby food containers. Yeah. And I, I, so, I, this, here's the thing. I, I'm certainly not knocking on his faith. I, I have the same faith and the same creator that you have. Does your faith prevent you from allowing you to use medical services? No. Once again, it is only when the officer offers up the reasoning that his faith might prevent using medical services that Seth agrees. So you would use medical services, or even not? So it's some, just your experience that prevents you, not your faith. No, in some ways, like for example, on the immunization, it started out um, with a rational concern. Um, but yeah, faith-based, I, I, you know, you'd have to strap us down to a table and put it in there. Okay. 
Does yes. that apply to your children too? Yes. Okay. So you wouldn't do. Would I do anything different? Oh yeah, I totally would. I I, I would have listened to my elders. And I would have taken her to go see a doctor. Because that's what your parents were telling you. You said el You said your elders. Yeah, you know, older people would say, "Oh, you know, she's, you know, like yeah. what you guys are saying." Yeah. So, um, how far back, how, how far back would you go when you would do something different? How far back would I go that I would do something different? When would you take her? When would I have taken her? Knowing, knowing what you know today. Knowing what I know today, I would probably. I probably take all the kids to the doctor, at least for preliminary stuff. No, I'm um, talking about looking back. Was it, was it a week ago? Was it two weeks ago? Was it three weeks ago? Was it a month ago? When, when would you have done something different? When you, I mean, you, you know, this didn't happen overnight. She didn't get this malnourished and skinny overnight, okay? This is a, a, a lengthy process, mm -hmm. okay? And this has been going on for some time. That's what I'm asking. At what point, you knowing what you know today, if you could go back and reset the clock to try to prevent today, how far back do you think you would go? Um, I don't know because I, I, I can't tell you. Um, you know, maybe... Maybe the first mention somebody had that I respected that she was too skinny. That she was too How bad. long ago was that? I don't know. Like I said, she's been skinny since she was born. So what? How many? How many people have you respected have told you that? My mom and my mom. <laughs> how was your dad? You probably figured dad just bad in your mom's play. Pretty much. Yeah. So, today, at what point today did you and or Tatiana think, this doesn't look good? The size of her, all of this doesn't look good. Today? Yeah. Well, we didn't, we kind of like woke up and she was dead, so. No, but I mean after that, when you were thinking that this is like, for, as far as, it doesn't look good that, that we didn't get her the medical treatment or whatever. What, at what point today did you think that? Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't. I, I guess I haven't really worried about it too much. Okay. Did did did, did mom feel concerned because of she knew the weight was so low, or what was your what was your discussion like with her about that. Yeah, she just mentioned that she's skinny. Okay. But, what, you know, the thing is, is that it, it's like, yeah, she was skinny, but that would be like the only thing. It, it, it's, it's like, okay, she's not skinny, and then she'd be fat. And it's just like, you know, everybody's always got something to nitpick about a baby kind of thing. No, and you're right about that. But, but Seth, there is a difference, and I have pictures. There's a difference between skin and No, I know. She was, she was thin. You, it no, no, to, no. wasn't thin. Yes, yeah, so I know. I picked her up. I know how skinny she was. It used to hurt. I used to... I, I, what, what am I going to do? Like inject her with liposuction? And that, what are the doctors going to do? But... Because but, but, here's the thing. There's more... You know, you know what the leading cause of death in this country is, don't you? Well, yeah, it's medical malpractice. Yeah, it is. I, I'll give you that. It's more dangerous... <laughs> It's more dangerous to take your kid to the doctor than only That's not what most people think. Most people think it's know. cops, but... I, I get what you're saying. Oh, there you go. We got... No, no, I get what you're saying, because there's, there's some stats that go along with some of this. But here's what I'm saying, though, is on this case, when we know, because you got... I know you guys are doing what you're saying you're doing. I know you're feeding them. You're feeding them protein. We can see it. We're not down either. We can look around the house and say, these guys are piling food in this girl. So when that's not working then we know there's something. There's Crohn's disease, there's diabetes. There, there is a disease that has to be that's not allowing this girl to absorb the nutrients for these foods. And you know that. Yeah, you're correct. I do know that. I guess I just never, I never thought of it. Where there's no family history, 
Um, like I said, recently, um, regardless of, of what the pictures show, you know, people who've, know, who've been around her for 10 months, you know, commented, we all noticed that she was getting bigger, so I was just like, oh, finally, okay, we're through that prod, we're through that stage, uh, I was worried for a little bit there, but she's putting on the weight now, um, you know, she's, she's clearly getting heavier, um, so I, I just, I kind of thought we were through it. Let me ask you a, a, an honest, just an honest answer. Do you re, do you feel responsible in any way for what happened today? I feel like that's a bit of a trap question, but um, no, I, 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 or do you just say honest, or do you think it's just God's will? Well, just because it might be God's will doesn't mean that there's not some that it's not His will according to our actions, or it doesn't mean that we're not responsible in some way for what has come about. And so, do I? I take responsibility on myself for anything that goes wrong in my life at all, even if it's totally not my fault. I still, what could I have done? Shut the fuck up, Seth. Oh my God, he does not take responsibility for himself the way he's claiming to. You can see that as he makes sure to mention the fact that he does that, even when things aren't his fault. It's important that he tells people that he is a good person, that he is morally just and able to take responsibility. But it's also important that people know that most of the time, he doesn't need to do that because things just happen to him, rather than the other way around. We can also see this in what he has said in the interview. He doesn't take responsibility for CPS being called by the doctors on his firstborn because she was malnourished. Instead, he says it was all a farce. The interview wraps up there, and Seth is allowed to see Tatiana. I'm going to play their conversation in full, as it's incredibly disturbing. So, I'll, uh, uh you just a couple minutes, okay? Yeah. Hi, baby. Hi. How you doing? Okay. How are you? Happy that I'm with you now. Me too. Yeah, we're because we're such bad parents. Not even allowed to talk to. It took so long asking me all about the kids, all three of their birth, weight, height, and eating habits, and developmental skills. And really, go to your pee and poop. And then, I think that was a distraction, because right after that, I was just like, why did it take you so long to call? I just kept berating with that, and we you tell me what? To call the police after. Oh. Uh, finding out. I told you like six times. I was waiting for the lawyer to be there because we knew that this would happen. Except I told them we were waiting for. We could see your parents, but I said the lawyers. And we were just. Then what'd you do while you were waiting? I called off work. I. We slept. And I sat and cried. Oh, no, that wasn't good, baby. You know, their job is to fill cells. It's their job. So, they can fill two cells right now. And that that's... Me, they were angry. Like, it sounded like they were trying... I don't know if this is movie mind, but, like, separate us. Of course, that's what they are doing. Trying to drive a wedge in between and then hope somebody accuses the other one. That's why they came at you first. Because they're... Because they know them. They can tell by looking at me. Yeah. They can do shit to me. So if I make a new breakdown, I'll accuse you of what? 
mi es un drama que no You go home and we get really big to me. I really like to not talk about it at all anymore today. Can't ever do this again. We at least gotta take her. We gotta. There's problems. We gotta take him to the doctor at least to see. Okay. Yep. I smell. Uh, I was counting down. It's hilarious. I think they must have heard me on the phone. Because that's uh, to my mom at 7.30. I'm getting up out of here. Um, getting us out of here. And that was exactly when they came through the door to come talk to me. Wow. Yeah, I was like, I'll wait for, I'll wait till 7.30, but we're not under arrest. I'm not being charged. I'm here under my own compulsion. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm free to go, so. Your parents are still there? No, they went home. They had to go meet with a CPS worker in Grand Haven. Oh, wow. But they can't do with them? Yeah. No, I was just about to walk out of there when he said, hey, come on down here. So I was going to be like, oh, he said five minutes. It's going to be another two hours. And, you know, he had me put my phone outside the door. Oh, he did? Yeah. yeah. I went out. I got it. I went out. I got it. I'm going to let you just hold me in here indefinitely uh, with my permission while leaving me communication with I saw the, I saw like papers in the bottle cap and the lighter was out there. They told me to go to the bathroom and it was like 20, 30 minutes and I really had to go. So I just opened the door and I went to the bathroom. <laughs> they're, they're trying to make you seem a lot more like a prisoner than you really are right now. You're here, under your own, you're here under your own compulsion and I'm not your own. Yeah. It's really not much they can do if we wanted to walk out right now. We're doing this as a show. And not even for them, but for probably when we have to go up in front of a judge. See, it's all they want. They want a charge. They want somebody. There's got to be money involved. There's got to be a financial transaction. So it's like you can't, you can't could just bury a dead body. Gotta, you gotta pay somebody. There's gotta. Be. Yeah, they were kind of like pushing me about a whole doctor thing. I was like, you know what the number one leading cause of death in this country is? Because they were only in there with me for about like 10 minutes. Was it? They were trying to squeeze you and get you to say something. That I did something. Well, it didn't work. It's probably better in here.
So you took my phone, too. They have it right now. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow's Friday, great. So, Friday weekend. It's a murder case, man. Is that actually a He may have been shy, but he hasn't interacted with anybody, so he wasn't. He wasn't interacted with to be verbal. Like, who's? Dude, put me on fucking trial. I'll put the whole system on. I'll put the whole system on trial. Put me on trial. You don't know who you're fucking with. really like they're just trying to get somebody to confess to a crime that's all they're trying to they don't care if they lie they don't care how they make it they don't care so you just don't take it personally and you just yep whatever I don't care what you think that was nice probably I don't care Get negligent, pretty negligent in bed, child endangerment in bed, which happen. Have fun. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried to go go to court about that with my mom. Okay. I'm not. Purple no pants for your mom. Just doesn't bother me. I don't want to, but I'm also not a fraud. It doesn't, it's not so bad. I mean, it's sort of hurt her. Oh, goodness. Oh, I'm hungry.
They're just here to help, Toppy. Just remember that they're just here to help. Well, yeah, I tell you, if you didn't say it so much, I'd maybe believe you. Who are you trying to convince? You would think that with the depth and breadth of the evidence against the two parents, that they would understand that they were responsible for their child's death. But that is not the case. We've talked a bit about cognitive distortions on the channel before, specifically involving cases where a person repeatedly harmed others, only to repeatedly state that they are not a bad person. Cognitive distortion is a term used in psychology to describe patterns of thinking that are inaccurate or irrational, and not fully based in reality. These patterns can lead to negative emotions and behaviors, and can interfere with a person's ability to cope with stress and navigate life's challenges. Seth and Tatiana both believed that they were good parents, and that their children, as sick and underfed as they were, were healthy. They were neglecting their children by anyone's standards, but in their minds, all of their actions were justified and good. This led them to believing any person expressing that they should feed their children more or being concerned for their well-being were malicious, bad actors. Seth, in particular, refused to state that his actions, or rather, his inaction with his own children, led to Mary's death. When the two were given their sentence, it was explained to Seth that he would be charged with Mary's murder. He acted shocked and appalled, with his jaw literally dropping when the charges were explained to him. In Solon Township, that you're both charged with what they call felony murder, while in the perpetration or attempted perpetration of child abuse in the first degree, they're alleging that you murdered one Mary Welch. That is a charge called homicide felony murder. It is life without parole. It requires a DNA sample to be taken upon arrest, which is often like a cotton swab or in the inside of your cheek. The second offense that you're both charged with is called child abuse in the first degree, where they're alleging you knowingly or intentionally caused serious physical harm to a child. They're talking about this Mary Welch. It is a felony, possible penalty of up to life imprisonment or any term of years less than life. Now those are the two separate felony charges. His lawyer would go on to tell multiple press outlets that Seth felt as if he were being punished for his religious beliefs. Seth would go on to do an interview with Wood TV, a local news channel, to speak on how the case was being reported on. Like before, he would refuse to accept responsibility for any reports made about his family to CPS. Seth would state that he was being blamed not because he did anything wrong, but because of his faith. By the time this interview would take place, Seth had begun delving into religion more than he had previously done, and throughout, began to use scripture to excuse his behavior. He also claimed that anyone who spoke ill of him and the police would be punished by God for their actions. Hello, Seth. Greetings, sir. What can I do for you? Hi, Seth. This is Leon Hendricks. I'm a reporter from Wood TV, and... Uh... We've been obviously reporting on what's going on with you and... Um, yeah, so I've been informed. You've been making reports of some sort. Uh, so that's why we're contacting you. Obviously, we only have what the police agree Yes, on. I would advise you to be careful what you say from here on out. Okay. You will answer to the Lord for everything that is said against me. Okay. Seth, we're, we're recording this people. for a story. I just... That's I fine. Give you you go ahead and record it, sir. Okay. What do you want people to know about this situation? And uh, obviously you're in jail and you could be there for the rest of your life. What do you want people to know about what happened? And do you feel like you're being justly treated? Am I being justly treated on the inside? Uh, yes, I am very thankful for the um, 
conditions that could be much worse. Uh, I believe I'm being unfairly charged and uh, being made an example of for my uh, very strong faith and the trying times that are ahead and being made an example of. So what really happened? Why, uh, why do you feel like you, you tried I'll to I'll tell you on? exactly, sir, what really happened. Um, my wife put the, you know, every day before my wife goes to work, she com completely drains her breast milk uh, into our daughter. Um, she puts her down for a nap. Um, it's been a normal protocol for our children uh, when they're going through growth spurts to sleep for even 16 to 18 hours. Um, so I checked on her, checked on her uh, throughout the evening. My wife gets home from work at about 11, 11.30. And um, sorry, it's a little tough to talk about. It's still pretty raw. Um, and uh, so I checked on her, checked on her. She's still sleeping. Uh, I really, if you put a baby down with a full tummy and a clean diaper, uh, you know, generally my policy is not to wake them up. I let them wake themselves up. Uh, I've never had a problem with a child not waking up when they were hungry or had a wet diaper or anything like that. Um, so my wife came home and checked on her at 1130, uh, said she peeked through the door and saw her, you know, move or said, noticed that she was, you know, still alive but not crying or anything like that. So uh, often, you know, if there's a noise at the door, the baby will shift or something like that. Um, I was up, uh, I wasn't feeling very well myself that night, and um, I, uh, so I got up, I was up at about 2 o'clock, still didn't hear anything from the baby. I went to her door at about 3 o'clock, listened at her door, and it was dark in there obviously, so no, no crying, okay. Um, went, went back to bed, I got up again at 5. I, I wasn't feeling well, I had, uh, let's just say diarrhea. And so, uh, you know, I kept getting up, getting up, and listened again. No, okay. I finally fell asleep, um, I don't know, maybe 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And, um, you know, I didn't get out of bed again until about, well, honestly, I think until my wife uh, came back and told me that she was dead. My wife had gone uh, right up the street real quick to go pick up some clothes from the neighbor's house. And then she said, okay, that's enough sleep time for Mary. It's, it's time to wake up now. Uh, that's quite enough. Um, you know, it, it's been a long time. And so she went in there and um, she rushed back into the room to tell me that Mary wasn't breathing. And uh, I shot out of bed like a rocket. And uh, we rushed into her room. And my wife began to, you know, attempt to perform CPR. Um, but I could tell from looking at Mary, I could tell because her, her skin was gray, her cheeks looked sunken uh, like they, they weren't when we put her to bed. Um, I, I knew she was dead. So are you and saying so, that you had no idea before this that something was wrong with Mary? Um, no, she was a skinny girl. Um, but everybody in my family's always been skinny. I know it's hard to believe with our per current condition. Um, my uh, uh, middle daughter, Elizabeth, uh, of this marriage, was a very skinny girl when she was growing up, and now she's bigger than some six-year-old boys. Um, so I didn't really think anything of it. Uh, in the Bible, it says that good food is our medicine, so we fed her. Um, we, you know, we, we were feeding her chicken, potatoes, apples, cheese. I mean, we, we were giving her the good stuff, and then also combined with breast milk. And um, she died. I, I, it's a tragedy. It's, it, um, you know, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh. In the Bible, it says that we are not to use sorcery. The original Greek word for sorcery is pharmakeia, which is easily translated into our modern word for pharmacy, which is all the uh, use of pharmaceutical drugs and, you know, including, you know, like things like vaccines, which um, even have ingredients containing aborted fetuses, um, you know, the, and all sorts of toxic chemicals, uh, which are causing allergic reactions and in some cases deaths. Um, amongst the populace and the more that is um they are being injected into the populace uh you know i think the results are pretty clear uh people are getting more and more sick there's more and more allergies there's more and more you know physical maladies 
So, uh, yes, we did the best we could for Mary according to our faith. We fed her good food. Um, you know, we gave her water. We, we gave her lots of love. Um, she just, she passed. It's Do you a, it's think a terrible there's tragedy. anything that you did wrong here? No. Did she look like, I mean, that she was at risk of starving to death? No. You're saying she no. looked like, if like it, a if it was, baby. If it was that drastic, uh, we, we would have done something. We, we, we would have at least found a, a doctor who would be willing to practice, um, you know, things in a way that is... Um, compatible with our beliefs but no we didn't we did not think that she would would perish oh i mean you have to understand sir um sh she wasn't sick she didn't have like a history you know when people starve to death they get sick um you know she wasn't crying i it, like i said we checked on her periodically through the night she was and every time she's cried she wakes us up both me and my wife my wife has radar for it i mean she's she's a tremendous mother and we will provide many witnesses in our court case to attest to that um she 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 just she just died sir and we provided everything for her and we have all the evidence to prove it we have witnesses to prove how loving and caring a parents we were and sometimes tragedies in this life happen Do you uh, wish you would have done anything differently? You know, there's, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, but then when I think, you know, we did everything we could um, according to our beliefs to maintain her. Um, she didn't show any signs of being sick or on the edge of death. Um, and, uh, and so, if, you know, of course, if there was something that I could come up with that I could have done to make sure that she was still here today, of course, I cry about this every single night. We had such a, our family had such a great life on our farm together. And it's all been torn apart. But I don't know what else righteously I could do because in the scriptures it says that the faithless and the cowardly will be torn apart and sent to hell along with the adulterers and the liars and the murderers. So we had to, we had to stand on it. We had to stand on doing as we were instructed. How many other kids do you have? I have uh, one, uh, eight, seven turning eight. Sorry, I just have to do the math real quick in my head. Um, daughter with my high school girlfriend uh, and then I have a four-year-old um, with my wife and a two going on three-year-old with my wife the older older two are both daughters the younger is um, a son both of my other t my other two children that I have with my wife are in are absolute examples uh, of good health of the love and care we show our children, of the effort we put into parenting and the care we put into parenting. Um, they, they are, especially my older daughter is, is, I mean, she's four years old and she reads and writes. They've never, yes, it says in the CPS report, they don't see the doctor. They never get sick. I mean, they, you know, they'll get a sniffle for a day kind of thing, and we give them their vegetables, and we give them their water, and we give them their rest, and we give them their prayer, and the next morning, it, it, it's, they're all better. And so we did the exact same thing with Mary that we did with our other two children, who turned out just fine, even better than just fine, many people will tell you. I... Uh, do you, I mean, you're, I'm sure you're aware that Christians every day follow the, what is known, uh, normal protocol after a child's born, taking them to the pediatrician regularly, they get weighed, they get an idea if they're at risk for these kinds of things. Christians do that all the time. Why didn't you? Well, without passing judgment on any one person or their situation, uh, Jesus Christ himself did say, 
that many do honor with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. So, you, you know, just because someone identifies as a Christian, it doesn't really mean anything. What counts is whether or not you're really actually physically manifesting the teachings of Christ. Was it if you? you're actually obeying, because, excuse me, sir, there are many men who, there are many people who claim to be Christian who think it's okay to lie, who think it's okay to kill. But Jesus Christ said that these activities are not acceptable and that people who do them will not inherit the kingdom of heaven and that they will be cast into hell. So, you see, somebody can't just claim to be a Christian. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. You have to actually then also live up to the teachings of Christ. He's called rabbi. He's called teacher because he has a certain discipline, which is why his followers are called disciples. So we must follow in his teachings and his discipline. And he said we are not to use pharmakeia. Are you concerned about what's going to happen with your other children? Well, of course I am. Um, of course I am. But I've already put it at the feet of God. I've already entrusted them to Him. I always have and I always will. Um, they are in good hands with their grandparents. Um, I daily pray that our family will be restored. Um, that in court it will be shown that this was a tragedy, this was not a crime, there was no ill will involved, there was truly no neglect involved, especially if we're going to take freedom of religion into this. Um, we did everything according to our religion, and Congress is not to pass laws against, against certain practices of religion, and especially, you know, our religion does not, does not involve killing people or lying or stealing. The ultimate law taught by Christ is, you know, to love your neighbor as you love yourself, um, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So uh, there's nothing criminal about what we did. It's a, tr it's a tragedy. It, it was something that was just out of our hands. And these things happen every day. Children die in the doctor's office every day. Look at, go look at the statistics of how many people in this country die every year due to medical malpractice and doctors don't go to jail because they, they get things wrong all the time but they don't get they don't get put away for it and if doctors truly were here to help us so much if they truly had a heart just to help their average salary wouldn't be like over two hundred thousand dollars a year while you know many of us who go to see them you know would like to make that and would like to make as much as some of them are making in one year we would like to make that in a decade mm -hmm. you know and so if they were really here to help they would not be charging people the way they were and also further there is no profit for a doctor in healthy people people have to be sick otherwise they have no business what were your hopes for Mary and how much did she mean to your family Oh, good God, sir. Let me tell you, every day, um, with the exception of one or two, because see, one of the reasons why this is such a, a, a heartache for us is because Mary had slept for, you know, 16 hours in a period, 18 hours. She'd done it before. Our other children had done it before. And they wake up and they're hungry and we feed them. You know, kids go through a growth spurt. I don't know if you're a father or not, but um, kids go through growth spurts sometimes where all they want to do is sleep and then wake up, eat, and go back to bed. Um, so, you know, I, I would feed her, uh, I, you know, every day about 5 o'clock or so. You know, things aren't so regimented. She would get up from her nap, and I would feed her, okay? Uh, I would feed her baby food, I would feed her Gerber baby food, you know, uh, chicken and rice or chicken and cheese, apples and turkey. And my wife would be on her break while she's manager, she's manager McDonald's and she'd get on the video conference and I have the, I have the history to show this and uh, um, on my phone, you know, and I would park the, uh, I'd park the phone right there on Mary's feeding tray so that my wife would be eating dinner while I'm feeding Mary, okay, and then she'd go, and then I'd pick my darling little baby daughter up, 
and because you know I don't because I do care for her health um, you know I, I uh, would me I wouldn't just put her right back down after I fed her because if you do that they throw up you gotta you know let gravity do its job to um, bring the food down the digestive tract so I pick her up and I take her and I rest her head right here and she'd nuzzle into my beard she nuzzle into my neck and then she would turn her head outwards and we go for a walk up and down our driveway we have a long driveway and there's trees and there's you know animals and grass and and a very large garden and so I would take her and I'd walk with her up and down the driveway and I'd talk to her about the trees and and the beautiful blue sky hey, and, and Seth, I show her the animals Seth you gotta understand that there are people that are gonna see this and go no way how could someone not notice their daughter is suffering, starving to death, dehydrated? Well, because, sir, I said earlier, and I'd appreciate if you're going to ask me questions, I'd appreciate if you didn't cut me off. So I would like to finish what I was saying before. So, you know, my hopes for Mary were, uh, and then also after I give her a walk, I'd often sit her in her stroller, and she'd sit there, uh, you know, in her stroller in the grass, and she would watch the geese and the ducks, and her brother and sister would play with her, and, and you know, while they were playing in the driveway while I was working in the garden. So my hopes were her, you know, I mean, were just to be a happy child who knows God, and you know, wherever the world would take her, that's that's up to her. Um, but my, my highest hope for her, like all my other children and every single human being uh, in this earth, including you, sir, is to know and love the Lord. And um, so now, if you would like to re-ask your other question, I'd be happy to answer it. Just, there are people who will see this and say oh, there's sure. no way possible that someone could not notice their daughter starving to death, dehydrated to the point where they're dying well and see here's the problem sir is that like i said when people starve to death they get sickly and you'd think maybe if she was starving to death she would cry right i think that's pretty i think if a baby's that hungry she's probably gonna cry and there's all and we didn't have that problem like i said she she died without a sound in her sleep my wife put her down to bed with a full belly full of breast milk there are dirty diapers in her garbage can, and she died. You know, when they found her body, she had a dirty diaper, showing clearly that she had received nourishment. Um, Seth, was it so, you who called 911? Yes, sir, it was. I uh, completely, my wife and I completely cooperated with every aspect of this investigation. Okay. It's our understanding that the person who called 911 said that they thought the death was suspicious. Um, you are the first one to tell me that, um, maybe, uh, what I, um, I don't recall using the word suspicious, um, maybe what happened is they asked me how she died and I said, I have no idea. So that it would be suspicious in that I have no idea what happened. So that I would take that as suspicious if somebody, if, if, you know, you go into your baby's room and she's dead. Uh, and you have no idea why, uh, yeah, I mean, that's sus suspicious uh, if they're trying to imply any sort of foul play. Um, you know, I expect nothing less, especially no offense, sir, from the news media. I know I know ratings are, you know, a business and, and crime sells. Crime pays not only for the criminal, but also for the reporters. So, um, but you know the autopsy shows no evidence of physical abuse of any sort there's no bruising there's no cuts there's no scars um there's no evidence of any of that so you know that's um that's an unsubstantiated allegation so and jesus christ himself said that you know people will defame you for my sake and blessed are you and people lie and defame and persecute you for his name's sake so doesn't it doesn't bother me one bit if you had a chance to say something, uh, one more thing to your daughter that passed away, what would you say to her? Boy, you're looking for a sound bite, aren't you? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a, 
uh, I love you. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you, sir. I wish I had my whole life with her. One, saying one thing to her is not enough. You know, I, I wish I could tell her everything, just like I have my other two children. She could tell them how much I love her, how much I adore her. She, but I mean, we had a bond. I, I don't, I don't fear the judgment of man because God knows how much I love that child. God knows the moments we shared together. And so it just, you know, people can revile and hate me for as much as they want. I, I know where I will stand in the end. Do you worry about going to prison for the rest of your life? Well, sir, when I first, um, like you asked me, you know, at arraignment, I just had this face because I, I could not, I, I was, I was expecting, here's what I was expecting. I was expecting involuntary manslaughter, uh, or negligent homicide. And, you know, uh, I, I wasn't ex because I got arrested for felony murder. That was what was on the sheet. And then the other, the, um, the child abuse charge was added later. So when I went into the courtroom, I was, I was expecting something along the lines uh, of uh, a homicide charge. So I expected, due to the circumstances, you know, a child died ac you know, accidentally for unknown reasons in our care. Okay, I figured, you know, negligent, I would understand why I would get charged with negligent homicide or involuntary manslaughter, but to be charged with essentially first degree murder and look at life without the possibility of parole, I was very shocked and I went to my cell and I cried and I cried and I laid down flat on my face and, and I just cried out in prayer. And um, I do believe that you know God spoke, spoke to me and said that he will see me through this. Um, he spoke to me both through his word, and I also received a sign wherein I was praying, and then I looked up, and the sunlight was coming through my window, casting a shadow of the cross on my wall. So whether I am to face the rest of my life in prison, or I am to be vindicated and, and set free, I will still serve him wholeheartedly regardless. Um, I, Of course, I don't... <laughs> I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison, but if that's how it is to be, then I accept it. That the, uh, we're still going to fight it every single. I will appeal if I if no decent lawyer is going to represent me. I will self-represent. Um, we'll appeal it to the highest level we can go. Uh, I will fight it all the way. Um, but I am not hopeless. I am not despondent. I am not in despair. And as you know, Seth, you're not the only one that has this belief about doctors and health care and uh, whether or not to engage their children in it. Uh, there given, are a lot of people. Sure thing. Given what you've gone through, is there something you would say to people who think or thought like you? Well, like I, I tried to kind of get at earlier, um, the story of Abraham and Isaac, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but, uh, you know, God instructed Abraham to bring his child onto the altar. And while human sacrifice in such a way is not a part of our religion, that is not what I'm trying to communicate at all. Please, I beg of you, do not chop my words. You will face God for it if you do. The lesson is to say that we have to, we have to be willing to do, go that far in our in our following of of Christ we have to be willing to give it all up to put everything on the table for him and so I commend them for their faith um, I believe we were chosen to go through this trial because uh, God has prepared me to be a strong voice for him um, whether I am to be vindicated and set free um, and the courts can see that this was truly just uh, I don't think it's unexplainable, sir. I think that the autopsy was lazily done. I believe that they found the cause of death, and that was they stopped there. But as we know, some I believe something within something caused her body to shut down that way. And I will say also that I had a farm animal, a goat. 
just a couple days before who died of the exact same way. He had food. He had water. I even watched him eat. And he still just wasted away before my eyes. So even just, given what you know now, you don't wish that you had been taking her for regular treatment from a pediatrician? Well, here's the thing, sir. I just don't... I, I, like I said, it seems to me from what I see, not only from what I see with my own two eyes going on among the people of this nation, but also the statistics that are out there that you can find that aren't readily published on the news or talked about in mainstream education, but you can find them if you look. I mean, it is, it's dangerous to take your kid to the doctor's office these days. It is. It just plain is. Um, and, you know, if you don't do what they say, if you don't buy what they want you to buy so that they can make some money off you, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils, They'll call, they'll call the government on you. I had it happen, sir. Dr. prescribed my daughter a head-shaping helmet because her head was like one millimeter out of round. This head-shaping helmet cost almost $4,000. When we refused to purchase this helmet from him, he forged paperwork against us, okay? He gave my daughter Elizabeth a clean bill of health okay and sent us out the door no problems but then after we refused to purchase this product from him he then um f added on to the paperwork after we were already gone and then gave a different set of paperwork to cps claiming that was malnourished There's, like i said we had we, our, our little girls are skinny okay so but he never told us it was malnourished until we refuse to purchase this product from him. So is a is a your older daughter? Uh, yes, my my middle daughter. So so they and, and, so CPS it, investigated you for her being malnourished as well. Well, here's the thing, but that they she was slightly underweight. I was a I was called chicken legs when I was a kid. Um, they found nothing wrong. We were exonerated. We were we were let go without any penalty at all and like i said the doctor was okay we've got like 10 lied. seconds left anything else yeah. you want to make sure we include that we are saved by the grace of god only and not by works of our in june of 2020 seth was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole shortly thereafter tatiana would turn on her husband and claim that she was not guilty of her charges, as Seth had been abusive towards her and physically stopped her from taking care of the children. Her case was unsuccessful, as she was also sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, as well as 15 to 30 years for first-degree child abuse. Mary deserved to go on and live her life, and while it came at the cost of Mary's life, her siblings are hopefully in a safe, loving environment where they can overcome the obstacles their parents put in their way. This case was extremely harsh, and as such, I hope you're doing alright. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos like it, hit the like button and be sure to subscribe. If you want to support the channel, consider supporting us via Patreon, as YouTube demonetizes the vast majority of this channel. With all of that said, have a great day and remember to stay safe.